Great. Um, the general uh, logistics for the meeting is anyone who's joining us remotely, please change your uh, name display on your computer to your first and last name so we can know who we're talking to and who's uh, who we get listed in the minutes. Um, when you speak, please uh, start by indicating your name and where you live. We ask you to keep your comments to or questions to about two minutes. And if you're speaking about a specific agenda item or anything else, uh, please wait to be recognized before you start speaking. Um, we have a couple of items, uh, changes to the agenda. One, uh, item six, the street closure application for February 11th is going to be moved up to the consent agenda. Um, two, the uh, city manager's review item 10 on the agenda is uh, is going to be pushed back to uh, probably to our next meeting because we had some technology issues involved in putting that together. Um, and with with those changes, uh, is uh, everybody approved the agenda? Are there any changes anyone else knows about? Okay, hearing no objection, the agenda is approved. Next up, we have general businesses and business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council about any item that is not on the agenda. And we ask that you keep your comments to uh, two minutes and Councillor Bate will assist us with the uh, timekeeping. And we will start tonight with uh, people who are physically present in the uh, in the chamber and want to be recognized Steve uh, good evening Steve Whitaker uh, again I protest the two minute limit I've got a number of topics here that are uh, I think your limit is unconstitutional. Uh, Elm Street that has not been plowed. The uh, the parking is cars are on a tilt and it's very hazardous to get in or out of the cars on Elm Street. Uh, I ask that the council consider. Uh, I'd like to know whether Jacobs is being billed for the parking places that are taken up by a walkway. Tonight, there's a car in the walkway. So it's, anyone's having to walk out into the middle of Elm Street to get around that section of sidewalk. So this is the Bit Nails location at Elm and Langdon. And the problem stems from the roof maintenance and the lack of heat and gutters uh, or snow fence up on the roof. And it's a recurring annual problem and it's a hazard with hundreds of pounds of ice and snow falling on the sidewalk because of building maintenance issues. Uh, so I believe that one uh, incentive for him to maintain his building would be to bill him full time for the meter places that are taken up creating a walkway. Thank you. I'll ask the city manager to have BPW look into that. Uh, Alternate side parking. I mean, you still are enforcing parking when you're not plowing. And and then I got caught just because we had two odd days fall on one. I dutifully moved back and forth every day. And then lo and behold, we have two odd days in the series, which should be forgivable, uh, especially since you're not plowing anyway. Um, the pressure, the water, I am told that it's water pressure blowouts. We typically are having over 200 pounds of pressure. And then we had some spikes uh, over the weekend, which blew out the main going into the TD Bank building and blew out the parking lot behind the Jacobs lot, uh, which closed Mad Taco, Positive Pie, uh, Rabble Rouser. Who's bearing the expense of that? That's lack of maintenance, lack of planning, lack of installing some balloon type of decompression or pressure absorbers, and yet you're closing businesses for lack of city maintenance. Um, who pays for that? 
I think that merits a question uh, or a discussion by the council. Um, the website is still, you know, I believe that when we voted to approve money to consider other options, it would have included looking at other software. I provided information on other software products that don't give illogical names of gibberish for every file you download. So you can't find, you know, a file you go download a dozen files. It's not, anyway, there are much better pieces of software out there and we're not using them. Uh, and I think we put money in the budget to evaluate them. And I saw no report that we evaluated anything else. It has been cleaned up a little bit, but not, it's not usable. Um, I don't understand how the city manager review is happening in the absence of a mayor, but uh, I imagine that'll be a topic for comment later. Thank you. Any other member of the public who is present in the room would like to be uh, recognized? Okay, and is there anyone online who is uh, interested in addressing the council? Peter Kelman. Um, I, I, I would just like to uh, follow up a little bit on the two points that uh, Steve Whitaker just made. Um, I think it would be very helpful to the public to at least understand what the procedure is for uh, doing a performance review of the city manager. The city manager reports only to the city council. How it would be great to have an explanation of how this works and what tools you may or may not be using. Are you using some kind of a 360 degree tool? Um, who, who, uh, who, who, where do you get input from to? to evaluate the city manager. I, I think, I I understand that that topic is not being dealt with today, but prior to it being dealt with, I think an explanation would be useful. And the other thing I, I just wanna just say about the website, the website cannot be made to work on the platform it's on. I know a lot about websites. That is a very old platform. I don't care how many other municipalities Bill says use it. It is decrepit. The the the, um, the search engine is is useless, and making it prettier, which is what has been done, is actually worse because now people think, oh, hey, this looks great, but in fact, there is so much misinformation. It is very difficult to find anything that is there. There are things that are just absolutely wrong, things that are left out. For example, Pellin, your your uh, email addre address isn't uh, linked to everybody else's like, like everybody else on the council is. Um, you can't make something look better without fixing the fundamental problems, which includes tons of content that is out of date, incorrect, and it, it's got to be a different approach to dealing with the website. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bill Dodd. Good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I just wanted to make a comment quickly on Confluence Park. I was here a few weeks ago to urge you not to go ahead with the project because I heard of the projected price tag had risen to 300% to 3 million. Now that I've seen confirmation Bill, of that estimate, I- yep. Well, this, this is on the agenda. Yeah, mind? I wasn't sure I'd be able to stick around for it later. Um, but okay. that's up to you. It will, <clears throat> if you want to get your comments in now and then we'll be satisfied, that's fine. Keep yeah, going. this this will be it for me. I'll, I'll be quick. <clears throat> uh, I did look at the materials and I see a lot of work and thought went into it. Um, and at, at another time, it might've made sense. I just think we've experienced a pandemic that brought disruption and homelessness. Mm -hmm followed by inflation that is making everything the city does and needs to do more expensive. I have other concerns, but it's really focused on the cost. Um, we've got so many financial changes, uh, challenges from the roads to the water system. Uh, people want to develop at Elks Club. And, you know, maybe we need another bond to, to pay for this park. And we're getting near the top of our capacity for bonding, uh, I would understand. So we've, we've got a big 
budget increase this year. We're going to have a new stormwater utility fee starting next fall, I understand. Uh, we know our school taxes are going to go up in 2025, FY25, uh, because of the way they're changing the uh, finance system. So it just just seems to me at this time, based on the cost, uh, it's not appropriate to move ahead at this time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I don't see anybody else with their hands raised online. So next up is you. Thank you very much. Is this working? Sure. Okay. Thanks. A little closer. Okay, thanks. My name is Zach Porter, and I live at 17 North Park Drive here in Montpelier. And I want to thank you all for the work that you do, the very hard work that you do, and for the chance to just uh, speak for a moment here. Um, I wanted to mention, um, we have a daughter who's here with us tonight. She's six. Um, on our street are maybe a dozen uh, school kids. Um, every summer, as you all know, hundreds, maybe thousands of school kids descend on uh, the park right down at the bottom of our street, the pool, the play, playing fields, um, all around the year, but especially this time of year, the intersection at North Park Drive and Elm Street is incredibly dangerous. I am a relatively large person. Most cars never stop for me. I wait for 10 cars to go by during the busiest times of the day before there's an opening. These little kids are crossing that street all year round to get to rec fields, kids after school coming to play sports, kids in the summer going to the pool. And I want to encourage you all to consider a crossing, uh, flashing, or some other kind of assistive device like there are uh, in other parts of the city, because a tragedy could happen there. And that would absolutely break my heart. So, and I'm sure it would break yours too. So I, I don't know if this is on your agenda at some point to consider you know, items like this, but I hope you might add it to the list of, of such structures that could be added in Montpelier. Um, so anyways, I really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I do not see anybody else seeking to be recognized either in the room or on the uh, online. So uh, we will now move to the uh, consent agenda with the addition of item six, the street closure. The chair would entertain a motion. Make a motion to accept the consent agenda. Okay. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda is adopted. Um, we're ne next up. Item seven is the capital fire memorandum of understanding. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is uh, to move, moving the radio project, regional radio project forward. This is be uh, entering into a memorandum of understanding with Capital Fire Mutual Aid System, along with all the other member towns, clarifying, uh, basically reestablishing, uh, reaffirming our membership in Capital Fire, reaffirming the appointments of fire chiefs as the representatives, and having each member town uh, sort of acknowledge their financial contribution. Uh, Joe Aldworth, Joe Aldsworth, who is the deputy fire chief in Barry, and I think also the head of president, chair, something of Cap vice president of Capital Fire Mutual Aid, as well as the main mover and shaker on our radio project is here. He really has visited each community and could probably answer any specific questions that any of you may have. Uh, may have a few. I don't know if you want to say anything, Joe, or just wait. And Chief Gallons, of course, is here. And welcome to Mark. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really here to uh, answer any questions that you may have, and uh, I'll just leave leave it to you folks. Yeah. City of Barry did approve this. Anyone have any uh, questions from the council or comments? Uh, I strongly comments? support that we could pass this. It's a really uh, incredible relationship that's gotten stronger and stronger over time. Um, Barry. I have a question um, about the membership, and so I'm, I'm still relatively new, so I'm still I'm trying to understand all this, but um, I see the bylaws list a bunch of members, and I'm wondering if that is up to date, because um, I've seen reference to different numbers of total members, so um, 
I just want to know who's who's a member of this or where I can find it. You don't have to list them all off, but where I can find the accurate listing. So uh, Capital Fire Mutual Aid is member is made up of 33 different communities. Um, okay. The users group, which is part of the radio system, is made up of 22 uh, different departments. So um, <laughs> the Televate report, I believe each of you have received that. That lists out exactly who is in this radio project. And uh, in the bylaws, I think in the charter, if you don't have a copy of the charter, I, will. I have I have the bylaws and there are 27 yep. towns listed. So, so the updated was yeah. 33 okay. to include outliners like uh, Stowe and stuff like that okay. that are not listed. Is that in the Televate report? I can um, see the full list. I, I believe so. Okay. I, I don't want to be misquoted, so I'd have, I don't have any fun. Okay. Um, the uh, the MOU just says it, um, it, in brackets list CFMAS members. So is that going to be added in? So or? the the MOU is is directly related to the radio project itself, and that would be the twenty two members that are being dispatched by Barry and Montpelier. Thank you. Anyone else in council have a question? Uh, yeah. uh, thank you for sending us detailed information um, about this um, document. So do you want to share anything like a general summary uh, of uh, this, like behind this project uh, to avoid any misinformation for public? So Basically, the uh, radio project is the uh, culmination of about 10 years worth of work. The original <laughs> project was an earmark uh, uh, that was received by Senator Leahy back in 1990, 92 in that area. And so now uh, Capital Fire Mutual Aid has maintained the radio system for this long. So as it is aging out, we've been trying to figure out how we're going to replace it uh, fiscally responsibly. So we were able to have this opportunity to work with the state to, to come forward and, and, and modernize uh, the, the radio system. And that's where we've come to today. The uh, MOU is, is actually a culmination of uh, the city managers and of uh, Barry Montpelier, Capital Fire, and uh, the town of Waterbury, Andrew Sheplak, who just retired. Um, so they said, listen, we need to be able to, to lock in the 22 members to be able to agree uh, how do we replace this in 10 years? This charge was done by the governor who said, listen, we don't want you to come back. We understand that statewide, the radio systems are aging and are not efficient. Um, so that's how this came to a culmination is how do we get 22 member uh, members to get together and agree a, uh, a capital improvement plan to plan for the next upgrade. So that's what this, this is all about. So part of the model is that the fees will be in part going to create a reserve to replace the system in the future. Yes, sir. Any other questions or comments from the council? Okay, um, Steve Whitaker, I assume you would like to be recognized on this to topic. <clears throat> so I think a little background is in order here. The this project is has not been engineered. The records requests show that the price tag that has been posited to buy it it re only represents about half of the costs. Uh, the Motorola spreadsheets that were provided showed at least a million and a half, two and a half million more in engineering operations, monitoring, network testing. Etc. There's no funding source for those. Uh, my reading of the MOU, which has not been uh, as precise as an attorney, I know that uh, others have looked at it more carefully. Basically, looks like a blank check. There's no financial. It's it's asking the, you to vote tonight to bind the city to pay the bills, whatever they may be, for ten years from now which is an absurdly fiscally irresponsible thing for any council to do. And the fact that the manager put it before you and the CBPSA who has undermined the regional model chair has sitting there so wholeheartedly supports it uh, should raise lots of red flags for the council members. 
But basically, when you read the MOU that says we will pay for it, whatever the cost may be, and then you look at the spreadsheet model from Motorola and show that there's lots of hidden unaccounted for costs, I would ask how many towns have signed this? It was represented that the, the member towns uh, are members to this MOU. Uh, has anyone, has any towns signed this besides Barry? I'm told, Barry City? Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, I received the town of Marshfield yesterday morning. I received a phone call after the town of Berlin and the town of Berlin actually uh, agreed to pay 10 years of their uh, assessments ahead of time. So uh, we are getting them in. I have uh, fire chiefs that have come forward so far. And those are the three that I have physically copies of. Are we talking that the <coughs> select boards have voted in or the fire chiefs have voted this MOU? The select boards have adopted and, and uh, signed the MOU. For both Marshfield, Berlin, and Bears and Bears. And what's the status of the others? Uh, they're all on the agendas. The fire chiefs have bring them forward just like Chief Gowans does and uh, that they will vote on them as they as they come through. Okay, thanks. Uh, but maybe Joe, you could also add the letters you got that were in support from the select boards for the grant application that went to the state that is behind all of this new equipment. I thought this was my public comment. Uh, I think it answer your question. It, it, it's responsive to what you're asking, I think. So uh, prior to uh, Montpelier submitting the grant um, for the state of Vermont, uh, I was able to uh, attain 22 letters of support from all the com uh, communities that are involved in this project. That was submitted with the, uh, the grant request and uh, given to the legislature and the commissioner. Okay. And to be clear, those were from the select boards. <laughs> that was directly from each of the uh, respective boards. Okay, thanks. Actually, that's not true. I've got all those letters, and, and most of them are not from the select boards. So I, I, this is a very misleading operation. But just the fact that you're being asked to commit 10 years of funding when we don't have any financial analysis of what the system is going to cost, whether it's even the right system. I mentioned at an earlier meeting a trunk radio system. We've got separate radio projects going on with Barry Town, Barry City. Montpelier, Washington County Sheriffs, and Capitol Police. And no integration among them, no accommodation of LTE, which is an essential broadband service, data service, to keep first responders safe. It's been left out of this design. This is a reckless, half-baked proposal, basically stolen from the work that CVPSA paid for, which was the Televate report, and then this city manager and this group operating outside of open meeting law, not keeping minutes, closed meetings, has hijacked the, the report from Televate and decided to move forward. And this actually MOU indicates that Montpelier as the grant recipient from the Department of Public Service is gonna give away the radio system to Capital Fire. That Capital Fire will become the owner of this this is just so far from diligence and responsibility and fiscal. I don't think it stands a prayer of getting funded from the state under this kind of shenanigans, but I really think you need to take a pause. Uh, you need to hear from uh, the former board chair, former attorney general, state's attorney, who has witnessed this uh, abusive process. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Chief, do you have any responses to any of the other things that you just heard? Mr. McCullough, there, there was a lot in there. Um, I did prepare a response through Manager Frazier. Um, just to touch on a couple of things. The 22 towns, the municipal boards, I visited them personally. Um, I went to each one. They entered it into their record, and they, they were indicating either they signed it or uh, they, they had the fire chief sign that. So I went to each one of those boards. So I take offense to that very statement. Uh, as far as the engineering, um, Televate was commissioned by CBPSA to, to develop a strategy and engineering. They use the same engineering practices at each of the Harris Tate Motorola would use. And basically what will happen is, is that they'll take that report. We've created an RFP through CBPSA of exactly what benchmarks we want them to, to attain and then they will engineer their own uh, system to meet our benchmark. The state 
in their infinite wisdom has decided that they are going to hire a third party vendor to verify that the system that is being proposed will actually achieve the goals that are there. And that was actually achieved through uh, Mr. Whitaker's uh, advocates. So they are in the process of uh, getting folks to give RFP, RFPs to become the state uh, to evaluate each of these projects so that they're not wasting their money. So it, it is a redundant part. You will find that uh, uh, there are certain people that want to have a third party engineering study. And from what we're being told, what I've seen done in my research, it's really not necessary because it's really a waste of money because we are doing the same thing that Televate did, that each of the vendors will do when they do an R, when they respond to the RFP. And then when we come through and meet our benchmark that we've already set through Televate, which uh, created the RFP. So that is how we've come to this level of, of uh, the radio system. Okay, thank you. Um... Is there anyone else in the room who wishes to be recognized at this time? Seeing nobody uh, online, I see Kim Cheney. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I sent you all a memorandum <clears throat> and I hope you've had a chance to read it. I would like to ask uh, Chief Aldsworth some questions, but before that, I want to say, I think the MOU is a step in the right direction. The city of Montpelier should have its own contract um, with Cap Fire. And that way the city would retain its uh, managerial oversight and, but before I go any further, could I ask uh, Mr. Aldsworth a few questions? Yeah, let's, let's get all your questions down at once. Um, and then, uh, so we're not getting confused about whose time is what. So get, get your questions mm -hmm. out and then we'll uh, give the chief, chief an opportunity to respond. All right, well, um, one of the questions I have is Is there a formula for apportioning construction costs? I know there's, I've, I haven't seen it, but I understand there's a formula based on population. But is the plan that all construction costs? will be apportioned among the towns um, on the basis of their population. That's okay. one question. The second question I have, <clears throat> have you estimated the actual costs above the amount of the grant that it would uh, require to get the system in working order. Okay. And is the intention that the Twin Cities would pay 25% roughly of all the costs above the grant, um, which is what it seems to me the MOU says. Is the um, cap fire going to solicit Motorola to finance the additional cost? And has that been put out to any bid. Um, and uh, has 
capital capital fire uh, any plans to seek a amendment to his charter so that it would have public members elected or appointed by public bodies on the board of directors. So those would be my questions for um, Mr. Aldsworth. Great, thank you, Kim. Chief? All right, so if I miss anything, yeah, we've got them in there, yeah. So the formula for construction costs. No. So basically what we're doing is we're taking the Televate report and the estimated of the uh, <coughs> number one most important part. Uh, and we are taking that. Basically how we developed a system with Televate is that we've created a three-stool approach. One of the stool, legs of the stool is that uh, the upgrade of the dispatch centers themselves. And each of the municipalities have taken upon themselves to do that. So Barry's in the process currently. Montpelier is scheduled to do this within the month. It's we didn't do a bond; we just had it in the budget. So that was taken upon themselves to do that. And that's the first leg of the stool. The second leg of the stool is the actually the system throughout the uh, region. Uh, so basically, they would upgrade all the towers and make a uh, uh, simulcast system that would uh, improve the, the area. The third part of the, st the stool is the in-building uh, in, in communication between the Twin Cities. So now that was a, a third leg of the stool that we put in there so that we would be able to, in Barry Montpelier, improve our radio system. We're able to uh, the Televate and our consultants um, to, to look at what we had originally granted from the state, look at, at the three legs of the stool, and we said, okay, listen, we can turn around and we can actually trim down the request to stay within the $2.4 million, knowing that the state is going to verify engineering and knowing that we can actually achieve in building communications going with a singular radio system to be able to go through with all the towers. Now, when you say in building communications, is that for when a firefighter is has had to gone in, go into a building on a call? Yeah. So, one thing that we battle <clears throat> right now is mass, glass, and distance. Distance to the radio towers, mass of other buildings and glass, you know, the windows and stuff like that. So when they go in deep into the basements, we have that problem. So with the redesign of the system, we actually took into account that we might probably not going to be able to go back for a second bite of the apple with the state. So we really looked at that hard. With that said, we can adapt the uh, three towers that we're going to uh, achieve the in-building communications, and we can adapt them to the singular frequency. Uh, Chief Gallons and myself feel that that would be beneficial to stay on the same frequency with the simulcast towers, cutting down on the amount of frequency because we don't have to rebroadcast and we can still achieve what we need to do uh, in the future. If that wasn't supposed to work, if that didn't get to work, then we can always go in and, and look forward to see how we can uh, apply for grant monies to put in the, uh, the third different system for the two cities. But right now, we felt that it was fiscally responsible to stay within the $2.44 million grant that was given to us uh, tentatively by the state graciously and be fiscally responsible and achieve the same goals. And that's how we came up with that. Um, as I go through my notes here, um, so the 25% payment of all costs above the grant, uh, our consultant is saying that we should be able to hit that target. We actually were able to uh, talk with Terry LaValle, who is also the state. Uh, Schwig, he's in charge. Uh, he's a private contractor for the state. Also, he's been involved with this from the get-go. He believes that we can hit that mark very easily. Um, the capital fire. Uh, this question is about Motorola for financing that gone up to bid. Yeah, so that, that hasn't even been decided yet. RFP has been crafted, and that was paid for through CBPSA. Uh, we have the RFP and that we are refining that to reflect the new request for the radio system. And, uh, and I'll add to that, the state was very clear that we should not issue any RFPs until um, they continue to finish the work. That's correct. Um, as far as the uh, the plans for Capital Fire to realign their board and put uh, public members on, Capital Fire Mutual Aid was uh, designed as a mutual aid system to organize the fire chiefs together 
so that one, that we're not charging each other for mutual aid costs. So if I come to, to Montpelier with my tower, I'm not charging the city of Montpelier and Bob's not charging us to do the same thing. We work hand in hand. A uh, perfect example is today's incident. Uh, we were able to dispatch resources this year. It didn't cost anything to the, to the city of Montpelier and then vice versa. Uh, part of us, we do have an obligation to the other towns. If I were to have a granite shed that go on fire here tonight in the city of Barry, I would rely heavily on our volunteer partners to bring in manpower so that we could efficiently fight that. And they would not charge us and we would not do the same thing for them. So that's how the mutual aid system came, came to bear. To, to go ahead and put a charter change, nothing has been put forward to us. The It would have to go to a vote of all the members of Capital Fire and it would go down that road. But at this point in time, we have not had any requests from any municipality or any uh, fire chiefs to do that. Did I get it all, Mr. McCullough? Or I it... think you did. Okay. I didn't. I didn't hear whether you have identified additional costs that you're asking everybody to sign on to. That's the costs estimated costs over the amount of the grant. Done yes. it. We're seen at this point in time, <laughs> and. Uh, we we don't we're we're planning to stay within the two point four four million dollars. Okay, uh, thank you. Is there anyone else online who would like to be heard on this topic? Well, could I just have a clarify on that well, last question? You you hit your time limit, but let, but let's get that qualifier out because I want to make sure we're doing getting the information out. Is the MOU limited expenses to the towns to 2.4 million. The MOU has nothing to do with the radio project. The MOU is is actually a pledge to the all the communities that are involved to replace the radio system in 10 years. That that the MOU has nothing to do with the radio project itself. The MOU has everything to do with the spreadsheet that was provided to each of the boards that will lock them in to 10 years of prepaying for uh, the system that will be replaced. So we felt that it was financially responsible to follow the governor's lead and say, okay, how are we gonna pay for this? Because myself mm -hmm. and Bob are not going to be here in 10 years. We don't wanna saddle the next generation of fire chiefs with our lack of pre uh, preparing and planning. So I'm not sure <clears throat> how you're drafting that this is, locking into the current radio system. Okay, thanks, that uh, answers my question. Oh, it's too great. Uh, the, the city does have its own contract with Capital Fire um, for provision of dispatch services. Uh, that is not changed by this MOU. Uh, this MOU was in fact, uh, in part due to concerns raised by the two individuals that have spoken saying there was no uh, formal relationship between the communities. And so now we've done that and they don't like it. I'd also point out that many of the comments we've heard tonight, we've heard several times before, including critiques of the engineering in the system. Um, you know, we have relied, we didn't steal the system from Televate. They, we in CVPSA, we worked very closely with CVPSA to use it. Uh, we received a design from qualified people that uh, know what they're doing and it received uh, criticism from someone with no apparent credentials or knowledge other than his own self-expression of uh, uh, expertise. So we have chosen to follow the experts, to follow the recommendations we have. We put in the grant, we've been uh, told by the state that we are in line for receiving it following the engineering review. And we are um, simply trying to uh, create the relationships with the remaining towns so that they're all on board. Obviously, if everybody doesn't commit, then we will have to revisit that at the time. This is, you know, we're knocking them off one at a time. We're one of the 22. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions from back to the council? If you're ready to entertain a motion, I would make a motion that we approve the MOU with Capital FAR and Mutual Aid. And is there a second? Any discussion on the council? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And we've approved the uh, memorandum of understanding. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Chief, for, thanks for coming, Chief. Chief.
<laughs> Next up, we have item eight, request for city council approval of design review guidelines. Long time no see. <laughs> So give me just a second, because if you're up for it, I do have a little presentation. Oh, there we go. Especially because some of some city council members weren't here previously when we came before you for the grant and the regulations. Uh, oh. Oops, hold on one second. Sorry. I'm going to share this for everybody. All right, um, so my name is Meredith Crandall, um, and I am the uh, city's planning and zoning administrator. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here this evening on behalf of the city's planning and community development department and the Historic Preservation Commission to ask that you approve new design review guidelines um, that will be official guidance supporting the city's design review regulations. Um, as the zoning administrator, I'm responsible for issuing zoning permits within the city um, that includes those subject to design review. And I also staff the Historic Preservation Commission, the Design Review Committee, and the Development Review Board. So I'm very familiar with trying to administer the design review regulations. So um, I'm, oh, there we go. Um, so the city council was provided with some detailed background as well as a link to the online design review guidelines and a uh, printable version of them. Um, and, but briefly, the design review guidelines are supplemental to and provide information that's um, for the relevant parties regarding how to comply with the city's 2020 design review guidelines, as well as broader guidance um, and resources for anyone in the city that's looking to renovate um, existing structures or build new structures, both within the design review overlay district and just in the city in general. Um, a reminder that the guidelines that I'm asking for approval of tonight are not regulations, they're not rules, they are um, really a policy document. So, um, for a little background. I'm but, sorry, but the people online, maybe they can see it, but up on the screen, the uh, yep, so, image is yep, taking over. Thank you. Work. Sorry, there we go. Your is that better? Here. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry. Um, so just a little background on how we got here. Um, development of the new modern guidelines was triggered when the city adopted the new design review regulations. Um, and those regulations replaced design regulations that had been in existence since the 1970s. Um, and we had a document that was sort of like guidelines back then as well, but it's it was very much a 1970s or 1980s document. Um, so, and it was acknowledged throughout the process of adopting those design review regulations that we would need new guidelines. There's actually a placeholder for them in the text of the regulations. Um, so the core of the guidelines are tied directly to provisions in the design review regulations. So that's what this bit up here is. Um, and they're providing, an, there's an easy method in these guidelines of being able to navigate through and find the sections that are pertinent specifically to someone's project. So specifically to windows, or if you're building a new building. Um, but there are some additional resources in the guidelines. So that includes things like definitions of key terms. Um, one, of the, one of the highlights is compatibility. Um, so what does it mean to be compatible 
um, both when you are changing something on a building, how, what does it mean to be compatible with the historic character of that individual building? Um, as well as if you're adding a new building, what does it mean to be compatible with the surrounding structures? You don't want it to look exactly the same. It shouldn't, it shouldn't look like a historic building if it's new. Those are one of the terms that gets defined in these guidelines. Um, there's also a lot of places where we provide links for people to get help that they need, links back to the city website, um, both to the planning department, historic preservation commission. Um, we also spell out procedure. How do you go about getting your permit? Um, in the online guidelines, all of these little, not all of them, but most of these little bubbles have pop-up windows. So if you click on them, you get more detailed information about that step and who to contact if you need help. Um, there's other key terms in here that are really providing a nice floor of knowledge for anyone who's trying to learn about their building, learn about their project so that someone doesn't have to be a contractor or a professional to be able to have a conversation with either the design review committee or read and have some understanding of what the actual regulations are suggesting for them. So things like names for parts of windows, types of windows, um, things like that. Um, if we have time, I'm gonna give you a quick little demo. This is also for the public who hasn't probably gone through them. It'll be really quick. This should link up. So this is a general view of the guidelines. There's multiple ways to navigate it. There's arrows up at the top to go by page as well as on the side. And there's always a way to get to the table of contents here. Um, so table of contents is broken into sections. So your general information, introduction, including history of the um, city, some Excuse other context. Mm -hmm. Excuse me that isn't being shown online oh, okay thank you places. all right thank you very much hold on you could move your mic over to the that would be okay um so give me one second I'll stop that share and let me do a different share all right so here's the um yep let me go back to the home page. All right, so there's the home page. I'm glad you're monitoring the actual Zoom that shows there versus what I'm seeing up there. Thank you. <laughs> so, so there's multiple sections in the guidelines. Um, there's a lot of introduction information and context. So context is where you see the definitions and, and learn about different architectural styles. The guidelines part here is the real core of it. This is where a lot of the interactivity happens. So that if somebody is knows that they're working on maintenance or rehabilitation of a building, they're looking at windows, they can go directly to that section. And all of these paragraphs here on the right-hand side, those all tie directly to design regulations. The first sentence is a, a rephrasing or even sometimes a direct quote of a design regulation. Then the additional language helps explain what that means. And each of those is tied to pictures here at the bottom so that you can see examples. Um, one of the, the clearest ones we have here has to do with window shutters. So one of the regulations is about sizing and hanging shutters appropriately. What that really means is that if you decide to put window shutters on your building, they should be shaped and sized so that if they were closed, they would actually cover the window. That's what historically what they were for. So this is showing you an example of one where it's really well done, where the, the shutters are, are designed to actually curve with the windows, where the windows are curved, they're all sized appropriately. Whereas this is one where shutters have been added on as decoration, but they're, they're, they're clearly not gonna cover the windows. So again, this is a design feature. This is nothing, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of, of taste sometimes, and these are guidelines, these are not the rules, but it's something to help people understand um, what the design review committee will be looking for, as well as new design review committee members, what they should be thinking about when they have these kinds of applications before them. Um, so I'm gonna switch back um, and turn that off for a minute. Um, so, you know, Next steps, really, we're asking City Council to approve the guidelines as city policy tonight. Um, and 
once that step happens, the planning department will actually be able to do a full rollout of these. Um, you know, I want to just acknowledge the hard work of, of our contractor that got hired through a, a grant, uh, Brandy Saxton of PlaySense. Um, she really took the Historic Preservation Commission's ideas and turned them into something that we think is going to be a really good workable document and helpful for a lot of people. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I. <laughs> I, I spent some time going through this and I think, I think it looks really good, really uh, understandable and something really, I think a homeowner or a, a contractor who wants to make uh, modifications to a building would, would be able to follow this and know what's being looked for. Um, as an overview, could you say a little bit more about what design re review is and where it applies and what the relationship is between design review and development review board yes um so there's a lot in there so um the city of montpelier as part of <laughs> adopting the different zoning districts also adopted a design review overlay district um, if somebody wanted me to, I could probably pull up the map on my web on the, the screen, but I, I think that you don't necessarily need to go there right now unless it's requested. Um, but it's a specific overlay district that covers mostly the downtown um, and then a few other other neighborhoods. And within the design review overlay district, um, if people are doing projects where they change the outside of their structure, um, and it's it's not everything, but a lot of things, um, then they need to go and have their application reviewed by the design review committee. Um, the design review committee is an advisory committee, so they don't actually issue a permit or put direct conditions on a permit. Um, they either advise me for administrative permits, permits that don't have to go to the development review board, um, and I take a look at the recommendations they've made, and if they tie closely enough to the actual regulations, they can become conditions on a permit. Um, otherwise, they're just recommendations that go in on the permit, things that, you know, the or options, things that the applicant could do if they want to. Um, if it's an application that's going to the development review board, so it's a larger project, um, say like the addition that they did on the back of the Gary Home residence, um, the design review committee made recommendations on the external aspects of that project. And then that flowed up to the development review board and the development review board is the entity that made the final decision on whether or not those recommendations flowed through. So those are some things along the lines of, um, you know, what kind of uh, molding needed to be along the top of the building so that the new addition echoed the historic front building. Um, and sometimes there's recommendations about how to say hide um, rooftop equipment, um, how to make a um, new window that's being put in a new modern window fit with other historic windows on a building. Um, I hit all of them. I think so. And so <laughs> if uh, <clears throat> so the, the design review committee doesn't have the ability to deny a permit application, but it could have what the design review committee does could be one of the inputs in a decision by the development review board. Yeah, there, there is a process in place where if the design review committee and the applicant are really butting heads and the applicant really just doesn't want to do something that the design review committee is asking them to do that ties directly to one of the regulations, um, then it go, gets appealed to the development review board and the development review board makes the decision there. Um, because, like you said, the design review committee doesn't have that authority to make the final decision. Okay, thanks. Any other council members have comments or questions? Jen. I'm not a homeowner yet, um, but I do, my question is about, so does this only apply to like historic buildings or? No, so 
Um, and this was the case even with the you know, pre-2020 design review regulations. Um, Montpelier made a distinct decision to go with design review regulations, not historic review regulations. Um, they're actually in two different provisions in state statute. So you have your options and they have different criteria and different aspects to them. So design review is not just about historic buildings. Um, and in the, the details of the design review regulations that got adopted in 2020, there are some aspects of it that only apply to historic buildings. Um, but there's other general aspects that apply to any project within the design review overlay district. Um, they also paired back some things in the 2020 adoption to say things like, we don't care about color anymore. Okay. The old regulations went so far as to regulate what colors you were going to paint your house. And in 2020, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of debate between everybody as to things that just didn't make sense that they really, we didn't need to worry about it. Yeah. Anymore. Color was one of those. It feels very much like if I work really hard and buy a house, I shouldn't have to ask other grownups what to do with my house. So <laughs> <laughs> that is why I'm I'm asking for clarification. Yeah, and the other the other thing to keep in mind is that in my almost five years here, I have found that the design review committee is actually a very very helpful resource. Um, and for anybody watching, even if you're not in the design review overlook district, if you want to just get on as other business, not be getting a permit or anything, and want to go before the design review committee because you want some guidance and some help in a project. They're completely open to that. Same for the Historic Preservation Commission, for anybody who does have a historic building. You're welcome. Thanks. Anything else from members of the council? Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, a quick question. Um, so, I mean, I think the document looks really thoughtful, well done, easy to understand, which I imagine is really tricky with this kind of thing. So grateful for that. Um, my only question is, you know, with the you know, urgency around housing, really active conversations, like there's, so there's a lot, um, for example, under discussion at the state house right now, of, for example, like anywhere that you, like one of the ideas that's being discussed is like anywhere that you have a single family home, you have to allow duplexes to be built anywhere. Like, so this would just be like, if you're putting in a different kind of building you just have to have the design be look a certain way like just i'm just curious from like your perspective is this in any way making it harder to build housing is it in any way slowing down our ability to build housing um, um just how 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 do you respond like knowing we're in a housing crisis of how this interacts with that yeah i i really i really don't think so i mean so montpelier zoning rigs currently already allow two dwelling units anywhere you allow one dwelling unit as long as the parcel complies with the, the the parcel minimums and you get city water and sewer so um you know that's that's a huge part of the city um and the design review really isn't going to slow down the standard process um especially I mean, even if you're not already having to go to the development review board the design review committee meets twice a month, same nights as the development review board. Um, and oftentimes for design review, once you get, we only need the application about a week before that design review committee meeting. And then often we issue that permit within a day or two. Um, if all it needs is design review, it's a pretty quick process as soon, once we have a complete application um, and the planning department we look at ourselves as being there to help people get their complete application. So hopefully they just have to go to one meeting night and they're good because we've helped them put everything together in a way that, that gets them what they want. That's really helpful. Thanks. To that question too. You know, the design review district is in the center of the community, the most densely built part of the city. So yeah. that's the, the least, I mean, not that you can't put new structures in, but to Meredith's point, um, anything that's allowed in zoning is still allowed. It's only the exterior. And, you know, again, I, I appreciate Jennifer's point, but it's also, we've got a historic, we take pride in the center of the town. So this is sort of a community standard to just make sure everyone is benefited from it. But it's not, it's, it doesn't zone out any uses. Well, well, it's but not- just the design review district. It, it's, is, and it's design review overlay district is mostly the center of the town. 
Um, and it's the other thing to keep in mind is that the design review overlay district, having that and having the design review process is also one of the items that is meeting one of the criteria to have a designated downtown. So if you got rid of that, you'd have to put something else in its place. Um, uh, yeah. That comes with funding. Yeah. Yeah, just thank you. That was incredibly helpful. And just want to make sure we're being responsive yeah. oh. to these multiple competing needs. But oh, that was, that was great. Thanks. Well, make sure that the public's fully informed on everything and how it all interrelates. So, no, that's great. Anything else from members of the council? Okay, I see. Uh, oh, Dr. Gil Gilbertson. I am Eric Gilbertson. I've lived in Montpelier up on Richardson Street since 1976. Up behind the state house, it's very nice. Uh, I chair the Historic Preservation Commission and vice chair of design review. I've been on design review, I think, since 2000. Uh, to answer your question, we've reviewed a number of the nonprofit housing uh, development on Berry Street. And they put in a second means of egress and did all kinds of changes to building. It's never really been a problem. So I would say design review really operates more on a kind of a collegiate basis, and especially with a project a project. Uh, with helpful suggestions and i think usually people go away with maybe a little different project but they their project is approved and they're happy with it uh i want to say a quick thank you uh this first this is a project was done with a certified local government grant from the state of vermont which is part of their allocation of federal dollars uh, from the National Park Service for historic preservation. Uh, and I can say the planning department has been very helpful and the project would not have happened without Mary. She is super helpful. And uh, Randy Saxton did the graphics and all that with it, got the pictures and she was, so it was a real team, it was a real team effort. Uh, design review participated, particularly Steve Edward, his chair of the design review committee. Um, and we, I think the Historic <laughs> Preservation Commission really set out to do more than just provide guidelines for design review. We wanted something more for people who own property in the city to be able to at least find out and figure out what the proper treatment of historic buildings was particularly. Uh, and if we also, of course, wanted to provide guidance to both the design review committee and the applicants and uh, to help projects, people design good projects. And we also wanted to educate the public about the importance of the historic resources in Montpellier, because this is really an unusual city. Uh, uh, and when, uh, years ago, when I worked for the state, I had the state historic preservation officers. Every state has one here for a meeting. They were blown away, uh, walking through the downtown and the neighborhoods and really want to keep it that way. I think it's part of what makes Mount Pillar special. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think that. The next step, we've got another certified local government grant uh, to identify uh, how we're new historic districts, both state and national register districts in Montpelier. And it's really meant as a planning document so we can uh, move forward with that. So the city and it, it has better ideas of what is historic in community even as uh, even if it doesn't fall in the regulatory process. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Um, anybody else in the room who'd like to address us on this uh, agenda item? Online, I see Peter Kelman. Uh, Peter Kelman, Six Mountain View Street. Um, uh, this is a very impressive tool that has been developed 
Um, uh, uh, I do, however, want to mention a few things very quickly. Um, uh, as Meredith mentioned, al although the design uh, 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 review uh, overlay is mainly downtown, it significantly includes parts of Barry Street and VCFA, the college campus. It is not only downtown. The second thing I would like to say is that it is precisely because it is the densest part of the city that um, uh, Lauren's question about uh, housing is very relevant. We have to be extremely careful that nothing either in our, that in our, in our guidelines or in our regulations are going to prevent uh, the downtown from being even more dense than it is now. Um, and so, uh, although this is what makes Montpelier special, it's also what makes Montpelier uh, somewhat of an exclusive community. And uh, that's something that we're going to have to really guard against. Um, suggest, um, um, uh, Meredith suggested that Montpelier already allows two units on any property. That is misleading. It allows it, but there are so many regulations uh, uh, for that second unit that it doesn't really allow it. Furthermore, although it's quite true that the uh, Meredith and, and the others in that, in that department uh, are very helpful, nevertheless, any business, uh, sorry, any development project that is undertaken costs money and costs time and, and has frustrations um, that uh, make it uh, discourage people from doing it. Um, and uh, it, it's a little disingenuous to say that these are only guidelines, not regulations or rules, because the guidelines can be then passed on to the Development Review Board, and then it becomes a requirement and a rule. So it, it's not all as smoothly as this has been suggested. I think both Lauren's uh, concerns and Jennifer's concerns need to be listened to by the Department of, uh, uh, of Planning and um, Community Development. We've got to get out of the way of preventing people from doing the kind of development that we need. We need to, and we need to reach out to people who are seniors who are living in huge houses and help them to subdivide their houses and reach out to people who have double lots and help them to do subdivisions in ways that are not going to be you know, co costing them time, money, and aggravation. So I, I, I just offer those cautions while at the same time, I very much appreciate and admire that you put together a, uh, a tool to make a Byzantine process more manageable. But now we need to have some less Byzantine processes. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I don't see any other hands raised. Oh, I'm sorry, Linda, I don't, funny, I didn't see it. Linda, go ahead. Thank you. I have two questions. One is kind of a, it, it goes along with Peter's uh, statement. Um, I'm not understanding the impact of the differentiation between not a regulation versus not a regulation or a rule, but a policy document. Could you explain how that would impact a homeowner? Um, so the the regulations, so the design review regulations, which were adopted as city ordinance, are the statement of the actual rule that needs to apply. Um, and for design review, a lot of those are um, a little fuzzy, right? So when you say that something shall be compatible, um, so design review really goes down to judgment calls of the design review committee and this panel of um, you know up to five people making a decision on what compatibility means for a specific application it's a very very fact specific determination the guidelines are there to help people understand what things like compatible mean in different situations it is just a list of examples of ways to understand um, and apply the regulations. 
the guidelines, if, if later on we we feel like some of it doesn't make sense, we see that there are problems with this, the way it's being applied, um, they could be amended fairly easily because it doesn't need to go through the um, planning commission and city council hearing process. But it really is just examples of ways that can be used in different applications, different windows, doors, um, porches. And nobody can point to that and say, you're in violation of the guideline, so you're in violation of your zoning permit. It's, like I said, it's examples. If people come in and convince the design review committee that what they have done is compatible, the design review committee has the opportunity to make that decision. It doesn't have to exactly match something in the guidelines. Does that help? Yes, thank you. My, my second question is about the map. Um, I looked at the draft um, design review district on the zoning district map that was adopted on 4-13-2022. I'm, visually, it's kind of confusing. Could you possibly um, project that map so we could see it in, um, and also it said it was a draft um, design review district. And I'm wondering, has is it still a draft design review district? No, so I'm, I'm thinking that you probably got to a older link. Do you want me to try and pull that up, Jack? Um, so give me a minute, cause I'm gonna have to, I was not prepared to do that one. Uh, uh, Wow, there's a lot of PowerPoints actually open. I only want to close mine. <laughs> uh, yeah. There we go. Um, all right, so I'm going to need to go to the city website. Oops, I don't have that on. No. Where's my city website? Is it opening Zoom? Help. <laughs> there we go. So give me a minute. Sorry, everybody. So it's going to be on the zoning district map. Is, oh, actually, it looked like there was two. Um, yep. Well, it looks like we also have the control map up separately all by itself. Uh, all right. So I've got to share this. Screen. All right. So this is the zoning. Can everybody see this on Zoom? Okay. Yes. So this is the zoning district map as a whole. And everything that's surrounded in the dark black bold line is in the design review district. And you really need to zoom in to see individual parcels in here. It is not, I agree, it is not easy to navigate. Um, you know, if anybody has questions about specific parcels, they can always call the planning department. We have um, some other map systems where we can search particular parcels, but each of these little items in here is an individual zone, uh, parcel. And so you've got to kind of map out, figure out where your, your street is and then figure out where your parcel is. So if you zoom in far enough, right, you can find um, East State Street is here. And so you can see that parts of East State Street, like up by the college campus, are in design review. So over here, parts of it are outside, um, but it's everything inside the black line. Um, we, we understand that the bold black line is difficult. Sometimes it's it's obscuring exactly where parcel line parcel lines are when it goes right directly over them. Um, so if, like I said, if people have specific questions about specific parcels, call the planning department. Um, there's there's at least two of us who can look up your specific parcel and answer questions about it. Um, the other thing just to keep in mind when you're looking at this is though, even though it's inside that black bold line, everything here with the red cross hatch is excluded because that's the capital complex district around the state capital. So on the key on that map, it says it's a draft design review district. So it, it's no longer draft. It was passed. Cor Cor just Correct. It's not a draft. 
Um, does it actually say draft? It does say draft. Yep, as of 2022, 413. <laughs> well, nope, nope, we'll need to fix that. Somehow the draft got left in the legend. Thank you for that. I'm so sorry. We'll get that fixed. Thanks, Linda. You've just helped to improve the uh, information the city is putting out. We got the draft off of the, the lines on the bottom and missed it there somewhere, somehow. Okay. Now, members of the council. I move that we approve the design review guidelines as presented. I'll second it. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And we've adopted the uh, <laughs> item. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. This has been great. Next up. Item nine, Confluence Park presentation. All right, does that work for everybody? Okay. Um, hello, thank you. My name is Kasha Ranjo. Um, with I am co-director. Um, my name is Kasha Ranjo. I'm co-director of Vermont River Conservancy, and I'm here tonight with um, somebody you may know, um, longtime resident, um, Bryce Schiff of SLR Engineering, um, who's been part of this project for Confluence River Park really from the beginning. Um, for several years now, um, Um, for several years now, uh, Vermont River Conservancy has been connecting with Montpelier residents and community leaders and asking residents what they'd like to see for the future of our local rivers. How does Montpelier want to face the river? And from these conversations, the community surfaced a very clear first priority, a new riverfront park in downtown Montpelier, a project that has been a city council priority for several years. We are here today circling back with all of you once again to share the latest design updates that we've been working on with the community and ask for your support. And with your approval, we'd like to move forward with um, to raise funds alongside the city to work towards implementation and realize this community vision. The proposed park is on the north side of the Winooski River just upstream from what is now one Taylor Street. So looking at the overall goals here on the slide, I wanna emphasize uh, a few values that we heard again and again via our community outreach and engagement. River access and accessibility. 
the chance to access the river for boating, fishing, splashing, just enjoying a lunch by the river downtown and a shared community space that's truly accessible for as many people as possible. Um, the benefits of this visionary riverfront transformation, the opportunity for Montpelier to become a town with a river and to become a river town um, has been and a resounding success in communities across the country, creating vibrant downtowns and thriving communities. Some of you have likely seen this kind of transformation right here in Vermont, where residents and visitors love Burlington downtown accessible water. Before we launch into the design, I wanna share a quick overview of how we got to where we are. Here's a timeline of some of the community outreach that we've led at Vermont River Conservancy from hearing from public works and, and VTRAN perspectives to conversations with families, with young children, high school students and older adults, focus groups with a full range of people in the community, including people experiencing homelessness, businesses, um, families, young adults. There's been a community survey um, really affirming a desire of accessible river access and a place to sit by the river. Those who have been on the council um, through many, much of this will remember the initial design and the community engagement and review um, with resounding support for really the final concept, which is here. I'm going to turn things over to Roy to dive into the design update, but because of this, all of this, of course, takes a financial investment. I want to first touch on um, some of the fundraising to date. Together, Vermont River Conservancy and the city have raised more than $1 million. This includes a city bond that had very strong community support on last year's ballot. And with city dollars already be done, being doubled with significant grants and soon to be leveraged nearly four to one. Um, as I turn things over to Roy, just to re reiterate why we're here tonight, our hope is that the council will continue to support this visionary project and give us time to raise the funds to fully leverage the existing financial commitment to make this project happen. Thanks. So um, again, my name is Roy. I was on the Conservation Commission for several years and uh, always enjoyed our, our city rivers. And this is really, a, I think, a, a once um, in a generation opportunity to get down to the water in town for many people to enjoy. This is just the river setting, and we're going to run through these a little quicker so we can have a conversation um, about the plan. Um, you can see the features proposed, kayaks, canoe launches. Um, they kind of fit within the context of the river. There's some shallow areas, some deep areas, um, as well as uh, some of the features of ledge in the river. Um, the heart of this plan is an ADA accessible path shown in blue on the on on the uh, map down to the river. So people um, able-bodied as well as walkers, um, um, wheelchairs can get down to the river, um, enjoy a fishing access area. There's actually an inclusive um, launch for people to launch kayaks. Um, we've consulted with um, Vermont Adaptive and others who use uh, um, waterfronts for um, events. So we, you know, we're really excited about this opportunity, especially in the downtown of Montpelier. Um, what, so one of the reasons the cost of this park has climbed is that the design has changed a bit following the community vision for the park. And that is really to create this accessible path as well as some of these features. And if you look at the, the grades, you can see there's about a 14 foot difference from the bike path down to the river. And, and so um, it, it requires a structural wall system to sort of walk down into the river and access the river. And then you can see a set of um, several sets of stairs that would go into the river for, act, for direct access. Um, this is an amazing spot for education. Um, there's been a lot of talk about parks about what the program programming could be here and for the schools what you could do here thought you know thoughts about a video camera and this is actually a um, we did a, fl a flood monitoring a flow monitoring program and it's a unique spot because Wrightsville releases in a 
pretty unnatural way um, to keep the city safe from flooding. And then you have, you know, 400 square mile watershed coming down the Winooski and they all kind of meet at this exact spot. Um, and so what you see here is the dark area is the frequent flood level. And then the light area is what you see periodically under a big, a bigger flood. And so the bottom of the park is structurally designed to be structurally stable for these flood conditions and ice conditions that we expect to see in the spot. Um, we're gonna look at a couple of cross sections and elevations that are shown on these lines. And this is essentially a slice through the park. The dotted line, you can see the hand, is the existing ground. And then all that material comes out. Um, all that fill is contaminated. And so that has to be trucked um, to Coving Coventry. And that's a big part of the increase in the cost. And then you can see a series of wall systems that these meandering paths down to the river. And the bottom one is, a, is another cut showing a um, one of the steps in, in the uh, park. And these are the wall sections. So the walls have been designed to be uh, mobile art spaces or permanent art space down by the river to create these really accessible um, and interchangeable areas for people to come up. And again, these are the visions of people to have um, exterior art uh, as well as paintings uh, into the park. Um, we're, we're getting deep into the design here, thinking about pervious material to allow water to more naturally move through this system. Right now, the site is filled with um, construction, granite debris, steel auto parts that are all very good to spend. It's pretty much um, a waste fill spot that we're gonna export and create this amazing public spot. There's been a lot of talk about paintings on the walkways, embossments that sort of highlight otters and all sorts of things that people cherish in our rivers. Another, a couple of visions of what those, what one of the walls up here in the river could look like. Um, and finally, one of the biggest things we heard was people want to go get their lunch, walk over to the park in a safe way, just take in a really um, peaceful, beautiful spot down by the river. It's really hard to access the river right now. And so we had some local designers and past people help us with some of the designs that kind of fit some of the aesthetic of things around Montpelier, uh, honoring some of the industrial past and you know, natural background. And this, all these four inch features are sitting here. So we have a lot of people sitting in this park uh, in their own spaces. And finally, the highlight of the park is um, something we don't have a lot in Montpelier. Montpelier is water access. So there's boat launch areas. Um, there's a accessible fishing platform. This area actually there is some good fishing right in this area. Um, and hopefully as the rivers get done the time, there'll be um, more river access to this. A couple of features. This is an example of an APA accessible fishing platform on the New Haven River with help design. Then here's a staircase with a boat slide for people to access the higher staff of the river. Um, we, we heard a lot about the budget increase. Um, Bill brought it up. There was a paper, there was an article on the bridge. Um, feels a little misleading because the part, the design has really evolved. Um, first, knowing that there's um, a deep source of pollution under the park area. A lot of people are on this ground right now, and it's something that needs to be cleaned up to safely access. Um, at the same time, we have to we had to expand some of the wall system to really create all of the access points to the river. Um, and then we talked about utility improvements. And so over the course of talking with most of the departments in the city and all the public that have put in the, the cost, really the, the design has changed and the cost of the farm has changed. So I think with that, maybe we'll end it and as we wrap up and then we'll get some conversations. Before you stop sharing, uh, one of the, if you go back to one of the, the this, this slide that showed the, uh, Blood levels. Um, if we had another 1992 flood, the whole thing's underwater, right? Um, I think the 92 flood would kind of come to the middle of the park. 27 flood, whole thing's underwater. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Sure. When you talked about brownfields, so have you looked at grants for that? 
So um, that's something that we're looking into now. And one of the things that I, I, as a fundraiser, I think is actually very helpful is that now we have a concrete budget that says these are the line items in the budget and how much they're co they'll cost and what they're for. And that allows us to be much more creative with our fundraising. So um, Brownfields funding, there is a significant amount of Brownfields funding in Vermont. Um, we have some phone calls out to some um, partners with the state to see if that's something that would make sense. Um, that's the kind of work that Montpelier really needs to be doing, whether or not there's a park there. And if we can cap it off with a park, all the more better. And um, I think with the, um, you know, with the budget, being able to look at um, the Brownfields pieces, um, we have a proposal pending with um, Vermont Arts Council, and it's pretty small. It's just $15,000 of the total project budget, but that's kind of an aspect that we wouldn't really necessarily think of the park as art. But now that we have the design and line by line item budget, we can kind of start to take away at that. Um, and so that's what we're doing now is looking for those, looking for those creative fundraising opportunities and so that we can fully leverage the city's contributions. Just, I'm so glad you mentioned the word art because I do think of parks as being an outside structure and beauty and art. And so thank you. So you mentioned that after fundraising, you can estimate how much um, money we can use from city budgets. Do you have any estimation now or you have to do the fundraising first? Well, the city funds right now, we can um, go back up to the fundraising slide. So um, the city funds right now, the city um, passed a bond at this time last year. Um, and that was grouped together with the um, pellet boiler and those few other items. And so the allocation from that for Confluence River Park was $600,000. So that portion is the city funds and the remainder we're working to fundraise now through outside grants. Thank you. So our share will be 600000 That's it's, our hope. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was asking. And, and so. using that, what's really helpful is that having that as a leverage, um, you know, no one wants to be the first person to fundraise and invest in a project, but being able to have this existing funding, including that city allocation, means that we can go forward to other funders and say, hey, we're a third of the way there. Can you help us get 100% of the way there? And it's it will be able to better leverage those city dollars. So I want to ask one more question about uh, money. So is there any like a uh, upper limit, right? Six hundred thousand um, dollar, right? So what is the worst scenario for the city? So how much? So how much do you estimate? that city might end up paying? Like if there's a, like a between, right? Well, our hope is that it's $600,000 and we can leverage that with grants. I think we're gonna need, grant. the way grant funding works is that we need to identify the opportunities. Everything has a kind of varying deadlines and cycles. And depending on what the funding sources are, there will be various hoops to jump through. You know, if it's EPA funding or FEMA funding, that's going to have additional kind of um, just, you know, steps to take in order to receive that funding. So it can vary from, you know, commitments within six months to a year to 18 months to, you know, fully fund. Thank you. Okay. Any, Lauren. Um, two kind of wonky questions. One, I know there's been talk about um, exploring dam removals is that would that change anything about is the design resilient to if that happens um, that's a great question thanks for bringing it up I mean if, if in many ways confluence park could be the cornerstone of a revitalized river system in um, where uh, people could use um, a paddler's trail from the distillery through town, stopping at Confluence Park, going on downstream. Um, so we've thought, we've heard the advisory group and the public have, have talked a lot about this. And so the design sort of um, sort of embraces future change of potentially taking dams out. There's been talk of Whitewater Park and to have boating features in town. So again, the park's set up to allow an event to take place in town. A lot of people come there and launch their boats. And 
if and when features get put in the river around the rat dam or down to the belly dam when you know there's bedrock and falls naturally. If that dam were to come out, um, then this park would sort of serve as a launching spot to, to enjoy that site. So that's all kind of been considered um, as part of that because the dams are all in a various states of disrepair and obsolete. So it seems like a part of our future. And I might add to that right now, there are kayakers in town and boaters that do like the rat dam at high water, um, from what I understand is there has creates a really amazing wave and pe people get down there into the river, but not that many people because it's hard to get to the river and, you know, with this work and in combination with potential dam removal and waves and things like that, it would mean that more people would be able to access it and have a you know, more equitable experience for all to be able to access that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. So first of all, the idea is really like you mentioned, it's visionary. I really like it. And it reminds me lots of like European cities who have uh where they have rewards and they are really actively using. So do you have uh any information how many months public can use this park? actively not, not only boats not only kayakers but like i have two kids how many months i can take my kids and go there and enjoy this part <laughs> <laughs> or leave them alone there and i enjoy enjoy, enjoy after <laughs> conversations um we've talked to the parks department about this and and it factored into the design we believe the upper part of this park, yeah, certainly the bike path is year round. Um, we think maybe that first, first stretch of the upper path would be year round. It will have, there'll be a couple vantage points out on the river. Mm -hmm. um, we also think that um, there's been talk about a video camera in this spot for both education. Um, if you've ever had the chance to see the ice out in the river, it's quite an amazing thing to see. We could. It could be an educational piece, but also for safety um, in this area. So um, I think you're going to be able to like ex use the park probably year round, um, the top half year round, and that the bottom will be sort of non flooding and non ice conditions. Yeah, very good. Um, I have a number of questions. I'll try not to ask every single one of them. You can ask Sorry. every single one. Well, <laughs> might not need to. Um, so the a question about access by boat to, to the river, if I'm bringing my kayak, where am I parking and how am I getting my kayak down there? And I mean, is that, I, I guess that's a little bit more detail than you really need to answer, but um, you, you mentioned that there are people currently putting kayaks in the river and how far can they currently go and how many people are doing that and are they are more people not doing it because, I mean, physically, do they have to like climb over brush and stuff to get to it? So um, would it be reasonable to maybe just clear some brush at least temporarily and then people could get there? Do you think that would increase the number of people who are using it? Um, so I think there's a set of probably I, a little more ambitious river users that use the river in here, in here mm -hmm. both fishing and paddling. Um, there is a canoe launch at the high school. Um, it's got a lot of poison ivy on it, but there's a launch there. And then clearly the dam is is too unsafe to access it from upstream. Right. So you can, you can sort of paddle um, upstream. There's a few... Um, I don't know, informal access points, um, maybe by the uh, the, the uh, lumber store um, and a lot of poison ivy, firsthand knowledge, and then you can paddle around the dam um, in there. Um, and then downstream, I've seen people sort of go over the, the new rock that's protecting the new trail bridge. There's a lot of riprap. People park sort of behind um, in the public parking lot there that kind of go under the bridge, pretty precarious. Okay. Um, right now, we have two um, parking spaces allocated for this, mm -hmm. um, and they're, the idea is that they're, one of them is a boat drop-off spot, and one of them is a handicap-accessible 
parking spot. Um, this is sort of our first cut and what's available in the area. Um, however, there is parking sort of off the back of the park. So you could you could drop off, walk around, you know, drive around, park your car in a public parking lot and then and then walk kind of right right back to the park. And so we thought about boat racks and sort of what that flow would look like. Okay. Um, another question, have you thought about putting a bathroom down there? Um, we actually did not. Um, we we did think about um, water for the plants, like a spigot um, for drinking water and for um, watering the plants down there. Uh, but we did not think about a bathroom. That's a that's a great need that great we have need. currently. You you might have heard. No. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh just a quick question about that this is probably not set already but i noticed in one of the drawings that there were a number of benches that had no backs on them and i'm wondering why you would put in benches that have no backs um we actually created a there is partial back back and no back benches, right. and we're sort of these are kind of some of the furnishings we're exploring mm -hmm. um I think the no back benches were actually planned for right further down at the river, um, have not have things sticking up sort of at the water level elevation. So when the river comes up, you don't have a lot of debris and ice hanging on the backs of the benches. Um, but the, there may be a little higher up, there would be a back on the benches. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the first answer, but that's kind of a, a work in progress. Uh, yeah, that okay, level. sure that's yeah. not what you said. Um, and then I have a question about your process of public input. And um, I wasn't on the city council when this decision was initially made. I was in Montpelier. I remember conversations years ago now. We're talking like five years ago. Um, and um, I, I would say that, well, I'm, my question is, did you hear from people who don't want to park? Hard. But um, I, I, you know, I, I think the vast majority of people are are looking to connect with the river downtown. Um, I, in a, um, a, you know, looking at some park surveys that were done back in 2021, um, taken by over 1,300 people in this community, which is just about the number of people who vote in any election. Um, those. Um, the, the um, about 76% of people on that survey said, I would like a space to access the river. I would like more improved river access. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, whether people are specifically talking about this space or, um, you know, just the resources in the community, there is a clear need to be able to, we, we have multiple rivers flowing through town and it's almost impossible to get into any. And so there's a clear need for people to be able to interact with, engage with the rivers. And um, there's also um, some of the feedback will be heard with simply a place to have lunch and go and support a local business and buy lunch, meet up with a colleague, meet up with a friend and go sit by the river. And right now it's really, there's not really a lot of space to do that. Um, and so this type of park is really intended for um, to meet multiple uses and um, so that it's a vibrant space that people can use for a whole range of purposes and meet people where they are across the community, whether it's somebody who just wants to sit there and have a sandwich or bring their kayak and get into the river or splash with their family and their kids. Okay, so that leads me to my last question, I promise, yeah. um, which is about exactly that. Who do we expect to be using this space? And currently the space is largely used by unhoused folks. And so, and it's um, meeting a certain need that will continue to be a need even after it's a really beautiful park. And so um, do you expect that unhoused folks will still be using the space? Do you expect that it will be shared by people who are, not there for kayaking and recreation, which are um, activities that are available to people on a certain income scale and not others. 
Uh, and so are we, I mean, how are you, in, I'm having a hard time envisioning this very small space accommodating lots of diff, very, very dramatically different kinds of uses and needs at the same time. So I'm wondering what, what thoughts you have about that. Well, um, I'll let Roy speak to the design pieces, but in terms of the community outreach, you can look at, this is not even comprehensive. This is just a sampling of some of the community outreach. I think most recently, um, just last spring, um, so there's a there's a group of Confluence Park advisors. It's about a dozen people who have been meet, meeting monthly, usually for for a couple of years now, to um, that represent cross section of the community, business community, um, seniors, youth, anglers, ecologists, um, a whole spectrum of of people across the community. Um, and last spring, each of those members went through and and led focus groups across the community that included um, children and young families, um, families with middle school kids, high school age kids, the unhoused. We um, had two focus groups right on site and set up a table with um, just snacks and drinks and talked to the people who are there and using the space now and asked them the same questions. What would you like for this space? And um, one, I, I, I wasn't part of that focus group, um, but my coworker who was, um, talked with a woman there who grew up in rural Vermont, and um, she grew up leading fish. She was guiding fishing trips, and she said, "I used to spend so much time in the water, and I, you know, as a teenager and young adult, was guiding fishing trips. And I'm so excited for this space to be something that we can be proud of as a community and really embrace. And so, is that you know, is is that population going to go away? No, that's going to be part of the space." And we've designed for that as well, with that in mind, to make sure that it's accessible for, for truly everyone um, and has space for families and kids and, and you know, business people are having lunch at, kind of at the same time so that it can be a shared space and a small space where I can talk to everyone. I think what I'd add is that um, we, one thing we've heard which is kind of been a burning experience is that um, accessibility and the homeless, like we're really looking for an inclusive space that allows people to do different things in a smaller space. And that's kind of what this design tries to do. There are pockets of the park that are visible yet separate. So people could be at the top of the town or sitting at the boat launch or sitting on the box presentation and all kind of having a different experience. The challenge of this, and, and one of the reasons the cost is so high is we're packing a lot of pieces and trying to create a lot of spaces on a very steep, small parcel that right on the So that's sort of, that's, that is really the concept of this part is that create a lot of spaces that are together, like in a way that looks separate. Right? But certainly, now I don't want to go and enjoy there with my kids. However, is there any discussion about the maintain, maintaining fee or cost for city or like other parts? Uh, my family, we go to reservoir every summer, but we pay uh, like a membership fee. Is there anything will be there? So maybe it will make the cost a little bit down and, you know, it is good for public to know this thing. Is there any plan uh, for that? The parks department about some of the maintenance. Um, a lot of the maintenance is going to be at the bike path and that that is ongoing and will, and will remain. Um, you know, we talked about when there's snow and ice, you, probably the lower half of the park is going to be closed. So there's not going to be a lot of maintenance there. There'll be a gate. It will get closed off sort of. Right now, we anticipate it's at this point right here. So maybe there's a little bit of shoveling here. Um, the other thing is that we know that the bottom of this park is going to flood, and that means there's some sediment on it, and there's some debris. And so that requires maintenance, maybe in the spring or after a big flood. Um, and we've sort of had all sorts of brainstorms of whether we have 
a, a volunteer group, a school group, or, or something to not dump all this burden. I don't think there's going to be a huge maintenance burden, but there certainly will be some. Um, we don't want to put all that. Um, again, I think a key to be here is can we sort of like take the next step into the final design, um, retain that funding, not ask for more funding, but we'll go and do our homework and try to raise that money and really kind of dial in these final details about the specifics and the maintenance. Mm -hmm. Donna, then Lauren. Oh, oh, thank you. Great questions. Great questions. You forget when you've seen this project for so long, you know, it's, <laughs> it's really good to have these questions. And I, I love the maps that you gave us that really simplifies the path and, and divides it seasonally. And I do think we should have a major May cleanup and volunteers and we should have friends of the parks. I think there's ways to get donations and support all of our parks much more than we do. Um, and so I, I really, I guess I'm looking at my fellow counselors and I hope that we can make some sort of a commitment to you so you can count on that 600,000 at least for a few months, a year. I mean, because we're talking already, we're half through our FY23. So you're talking 25, 26. And so I, I know you need that anchor. So I would hope that we can keep that anchor for you and see what's down the road in 18 months. Lauren. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess I was hoping to get some clarity. Like, I guess my two questions are, could you just walk through um, the process? So tonight, if we commit um, to maintaining the commitment to the 600,000 that uh, the voters approve, then your plan is to go try to fundraise. And then in 18 months, like we'll be getting reports back on how it's going, but the plan is try to raise everything and do the plan as laid out here, you know, with the final design pieces. Um, is there, is there a way of like phasing it or say you get part of the money? Are there ways to, to get going and do some of the work that we know has to happen, like removing the contaminated soil, building some of the features and then phasing others in over time as, um, as funding becomes available or grant grants become uh, open? It's a good question. Um, as soon as we started seeing where this was going, we started thinking about they, uh, what what could we reduce? I mean, we're all aware of where we're at in the world um, it, and everything's expensive and we have a lot of needs. Um, the key, one of the key things, if you really wanna take a dent out of the budget here, you have to take away accessibility. And that was the like the heart of the part. So that really put us, Okay, we this is really where we want to go, and then we thought, well, we can take out some of the local crafts benches, and and so we, you know, you start chipping away, and it doesn't add up to a lot, and then it, then you have this amazing, accessible area, but you don't have the things that could just really make it truly wonderful to be in. So we can phase a few things and pull a few things off, but it doesn't get you far without really going against the vision of the park that the people sort of set us forward on. Um, we have talked about staging. It's complicated because it's such a small area, it's flood prone, and you kind of have to sequence this thing from the bottom up. And so maybe you could build the lower half and then stabilize the upper half. And that actually, actually adds cost to phase something like that. Um, so we kind of landed at coming to you for this request to maintain this budget. Um, Kasha, we can maybe work some fundraising magic and and bring this home, um, and then otherwise we'll have to sort of figure something out to the stage back or go up. I'm sort of, I mean, this is kind of that's just our recent thought process. Sure. And and just to be clear, I know we've talked about it um, during the budget process, but these the bond funds will not be expended until we make a, a formal decision, which this would not be that decision. This would be committing to giving you the, the green light to go and try to fundraise, um, but we wouldn't actually issue this bond until we're kind of just for people to be clear on. Okay. Jen, would you? It's on. Okay. <laughs> um, question. So, uh, because we put this on the warning, right? People will vote. 
So when they vote yes, this project will have six hundred thousand dollar from city. So actually, this was included in the bond last year, and so the six hundred thousand was already approved. We haven't issued the bonds. We haven't gone to the bank and borrowed the money. At the triggers us having to pay it back. So we have authorization to borrow $600,000. We haven't done that. We've done some of the other projects that are included in that bond. On this year's warning, we asked for more flexibility so that if this project weren't viable or other projects in the department, we could move the money around and have more flexibility for the use. But we have not spent the money for this other than the part of, we do have a grant that if we don't use this money, we have to repay part of that brief, so that probably would come from the 600,000 dollars so that's the only place to pay that money. When would that, that have to be paid back? I, I, that's what I'm asking. What? Alex. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he's on, so we can ask him that when he gets right. So the, the, he, I'm trying, I probably didn't mean to complicate matters, but we, we, we have a grant to do this project and the design work and this and others is being paid out of that room. If we don't sort of if we do the project, then that's all eligible cost and part of the room. If we don't do the project, then we have to repay that portion of the grant that we already spent from some source. So it could come from, you know, we could only borrow 150,000 out of the 600,000 or whatever, or we could take it out of some other budget line. Like we would have to identify the funding source at that time. So what, Two questions, which was the, what's the grant that you're talking about and how much have we spent out of it already? And Alec Ellsworth has his hand up. Okay. Alec, why don't you answer that if you can? Yeah, hi, um, Alec Ellsworth, the parks director. Um, we have two grants, um, both of which were sort of design build grants in the sense that uh, the park was intended to be this phase of design was intended to be done with the money and then other money was supposed to be spent building the park. So um, either one, you know, basically neither of those grants, neither of the granting agencies would want to give us the money if we were not going to build the park. So we would have to spend, we would have to pay, you know, SLR, <laughs> Roy's firm. We have a contract with them for I forget what it is, but it's basically somewhere around $120,000, $125,000 to do this final design work and engineering. Um, and so that would come from the bond if uh, if we didn't move forward with construction. Or some other, whatever source we decide. Mm -hmm. and, and which, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the fundraising list and there's clean water funding, downtown transportation fund, land and water conservation fund. I'm assuming that one of those is the source of which, this money. Which of those? Um, they, well, yeah, the it, land water conservation fund, I guess is a short answer. Um, okay. but yeah, those, the, all those grants would go away if, if we didn't move to construction yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Donna. I'd like to make a motion. Well, we haven't had, uh, we haven't, we, we haven't had any public comment yet. And so, yeah, I, I would just say from my perspective, you know, I, I thought this is a very exciting, uh, idea when it came to us and it, uh, you know it, it's a great evolution that we see in other cities around the northeast especially where what used to be an industrial waterfront and is not hasn't been needed for industrial applications for many years uh, and so we've got a choice of either leaving the waterfront be just kind of a crummy uh, river or lakefront or doing something very attractive with it you know i just saw in the times yesterday that the city of new york is opening up the first beach on manhattan people aren't allowed to swim in the hudson river yet but uh but it's a start um so i think it's a very attractive thing to do but uh, i can also tell you that uh, I, we've gotten a lot of communication from people about this and people are really saying well, you know, it was one thing if it's it was six hundred thousand dollars. When we're talking about two or three million, it's pretty hard to imagine going forward. So it's encouraging to hear you say that you think you can raise another two million and we'll see. Um 
but we have some people online who want to be uh, recognized, uh, starting with the Dee Dee Brush. You've had your hand up for a long time. Hi, thank you, Dee Dee Brush, Liberty Street. Um, a couple of my questions, it sounds like some of it has been touched on already. Um, in all of the drawings, um, you show that there are steps and or lunch, launch areas, including a lot of tree plantings in the flood, flood zone. Um, I assume that means that all of that concrete would be compromised and many of the trees would be eroded and or lost. So I'm wondering why trees down there, other than perhaps um, stabilizing the stream bank, it seems it, it's pretty, but it seems um, impractical. So that's one question I have. Um, I'll, I'll go through them and then hopefully um, the, the people from DNRC, uh, DRC will answer the questions or council members. Mm -hmm. We have a terrible history of a track record of maintenance. Um, Donna mentioned volunteers taking care of parks. Well, that doesn't happen. There, I've been volunteering, taking care of, by the way, City Hall Park, which to, the city does not do. It doesn't take care of any of its planted areas. It mows lawns and that's about it. So I think it's wishful thinking to think that maintenance can be taken care of by volunteers. It has to be plugged in to the budget, which means staff. And if it isn't, then you're making, in my view, you're making a mistake. Um, and also, you know, we're up to $3 million and that's without a shovel in the ground and probably a year to 18 months away. My guess is 3 million will get inflated just because of inflation, if no other reason, and cost will rise. It's probably, I've heard from somebody who served on the advisory committee and therefore was informed throughout this process that it could easily be 4 million. So please keep your eyes open. Please do not, yes, it would be lovely to have access to the river, but we've seen what it has been in the last 18 months. I think that if we have a bunch of people who are using it for living space, the numbers of users families, children, others might not be robust. Um, so um, I, I think it has to be very, very careful. I know I have one minute. Um, I think it has to be very carefully thought through and analyzed again. And so I'd love your answers. Oh, and the two parking spots, that seems a little minimal because there's no parking behind the other parking is paid parking from um, uh, the plaza, as I understand, on the other side of the um, railroad tracks, is it not? So where are they going to park? Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to try to tick off the that may. <laughs> first, first question was why trees? Yeah, so. Um, well, and steps. And steps. So the. The bottom of the park will be resilient to the flooding that's going to happen. Um, we know the patterns. Wa sometimes water backs into there because you have two rivers coming together. Sometimes it will rush down. So there'll be mechanisms, whether it's pinning, anchoring. Um, and the trees, you know, we're trying to balance a accessible riverfront with a naturalistic riverfront. Um, so oh. the idea is the plantings. A lot of the plantings are actually in planters surrounded. So when there's a big ice load, they'll actually be a little protected, um, but they will shake, cast shade, provide some habitat. And um, yeah, so we're gonna try to sort of blend it into the, the riverbank that's adjacent to the park, bring some landscaping through there uh, and also make it a robust bottom. And we're thinking a lot about that. Um, Let's see, the parking I was referring to is actually the, the public parking, um, Julio's and the Fed. There's a lot of public parking in there. So um, you would drop, drop your boat, drive around, and that's one nearby. There's also some public parking along, you know, there's along the street that you can go, go up and actually use the bike path to get there. Um, this is probably something we need to think a little further about. Like you said, do a little bit of more analysis. Um, we did ask if we could grab 
a couple more spots from the one Taylor lot and that was um, not allowed. So we have two right now and that's where we're at. Um, let's see, um, we've thought a bit about who will be using the park, the safety, um, and um, we've created the plantings and the slopes to sort of be not to make sure they weren't isolated so that the, the park is openly visible. And our thought is that the more people can see, the more that a broader cast of users will feel comfortable seeing the park um, and try to like, we, we purposely are not creating like isolated hidden spots around the park that can lead to all sorts of bad activities. Mm -hmm. And that was a recommendation from the police. Um, okay. no, it, um, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, it, it's very attractive. I don't dispute that at all. I let's, just think let's that... let him keep answering questions. Okay, sorry. And it's then um, cost over know. next Ma maintenance and uh, oh yeah and inflation with the other. Yeah, the right, inflation. Right. Yeah. I can jump in on maintenance too whenever we get to that. Okay, maybe I'll hit the inflation because you are right, two to three percent. Um, we are in the preliminary design phase, and um, I feel like we have a really good understanding of where this design came from and where it is now. Um, you know, three, five percent inflation, yes. A whole another million dollars, that's really unlikely. That the, this budget isn't going there. Um I and just so people know, um, and Phil spoke about this, like we all we all share this concern, right? Um, about the cost of the part. And and again, um we're not here asking the city for this money that, you know, I live here, I don't, it's just something we wouldn't, we wouldn't do. That's the whole point is to maintain this money and then go fundraise. And hopefully we get lucky on that. So I, I just wanted to echo that. And then maybe I'll turn it over to Alex to talk maintenance. Yeah. Yeah, we, we um actually, I think we're, you know, we're all disappointed that the park, when we passed the bond, we, we kind of thought the park would be being built um, this year. And we were all disappointed to see where things went. Um, our plan for maintenance when back when we were thinking this park was going to be built was um, to have a seasonal position. Um, we have a lot of sort of green space and recreational assets downtown, including a rec path, including the flowers at Montpelier Live Waters, maybe some of the stuff Dee Dee's doing, <laughs> um, Blanchard Park, um, the you know the existing Confluence Park, and. It, we were calling it an urban ranger position, which is something Burlington has. Uh, they have a lot of them, but <laughs> we were proposing, proposing one seasonal position to take care of all these downtown assets and really make Montpelier more beautiful uh, in the summer season. And when it became clear that Confluence Park wasn't going to be built, we and it was very challenging budget budget year. Um, you know, we took that out along with many, many other things. Um, but I think the concept still holds and it still holds now. We felt like Confluence Park really tipped the scales to making it really needed. Um, but I think if we, that that was our plan for maintenance. Um, and then I also just wanna raise, um, thanks to Roy and Kasha for a great presentation and sorry, I'm not there in person. Um, just home tonight for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, there are a couple, there are, I think three three big things, um, three big sort of silver linings to the project getting delayed um, that arose. You know, when we started to think about this being more long term. One is um, we have money to study dam removal, um, and we can be doing that while we're looking for more funds to um, build this park. Two is um, we have money to study what a whitewater park would look like in that location um, through a grant. We can be doing that too. And then three, um, we really wanted to look into the connection between this park and State Street to make it, um, you know, better access from, you know, all the state offices and where people are getting lunch. And so we have extra time to do that now. Um, and all of these pieces coming together, they were all part of the vision for Confluence Park. Oh, and then the fourth is the CSO um, thing, which there's one just upstream on the North Branch River. And my understanding is the East State Street project is going to mitigate the impact of that to some degree, and I know DPW is also working hard on eliminating those, eliminating those. but those were all pieces um, that were part of the park vision, and, you know, we had a lot of money raised to build the park, 
we thought it was going to move forward and and it's taking longer and I appreciate the deliberation here and thoughtfulness. Ultimately, it's up to council, but those are just a few things that sort of came up as potential silver linings to the delay. Thanks, Alec. Um, it's 840 now. I was uh, hoping earlier that we were getting close enough to the end of our agenda that uh, we could power through without taking a break, but I don't think we're going to be able to do that. We usually take a break at 830. So at this point, we'll take a 10 minute break and uh, I appreciate you all for participating and staying online, and we'll be back at 3.50. We are ready to come back into uh, session. Um, I know there are people waiting uh, online. We have someone in the in the room who needs to uh, to leave, so we're going to recognize Zachary or Zach again on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Zach Porter again, resident of 17 North Park Drive. Um, and thanks for this public comment opportunity. And I do appreciate you letting me go first. I've got to get a, a young one here who we need to get home way past her bedtime. <laughs> um, I I wanted to just speak in support of, uh, you know, anything that this uh, body can do to help with the acquisition of Confluence Park. Um, Confluence Park is just the beginning of the transformed not failure. And I say this having lived in a community, Missoula, Montana, for 10 years, which had maybe a very similar uh, riverfront that for many, many years was degraded, polluted, inaccessible. And today is held up as a, I mean, I think easily one of the best examples anywhere in the United States of a transformational uh, you know, project for that resulting in, in huge economic development for the city uh, making it a not just national but international destination, host of competitions on the river, a uh, place that people go for farmers markets, for concerts, um, you name it. That to me is the, the vision that we are just launching into here with Confluence Park, just the beginning. And so without taking this first step, you know, it's hard to figure out how we'll take the next. And this might seem like a small, corner along uh, this you know, large stretch of, of river along the North Branch and the Winooski. But I think it really is just that, that uh, first, first step. So please, uh, you know, whatever this body can do to move this project forward um, can't come too soon and can't be, uh, I think, you know, too, too large a, a, uh, a step in the right direction here. So I uh, just really appreciate the presentations today and uh, hope that you'll move forward. So thank you. Great, thanks for staying. Um, next up, we have Linda Berger. Thank you. Um, I have one point of information and two questions. The point of information is that Gateway Park um, is part of our system and it sits at the edge of the Winooski. It has a uh, parking area, river access, and a canoe launch. So I just wanted to remind people about that. And it is used by fishing people. It's used by boating people. It's used by people that sit and look at the river there. Um, but my two questions are one, um, Kasha had indicated that the um, gateway, that the Confluence Park would be accessible for as many people as possible. So my question is, where would somebody in a wheelchair be unable to access um, Confluence Park? Can we go back to the map? Um, okay. All right, can you see the map now on the screen? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, looks like it's a little cut off key parts the bottom. Um, so, um, we, okay, okay, good. Um, 
So wheelchair accessibility would be able to come down the blue dash line um, to the edge of these stairs and then onto this fishing platform here that's at the bottom of the screen. And then there's actually a ramp proposed into the river um, to be a inclusive boat launch. And they consulted with Vermont Adaptive on what that looks like. So the steps that people are able to enter the river into would not be accessible. There wouldn't be like a ramp there for people. That's right. So the steps are not, and this ramp is off to the side here. Thank you. And my last uh, question, I think this is more for Alec. At, at one point, there was a talk about that a lifeguard would be needed for, um, maybe it was, I'm not sure how much use of the park was planned at that point, but there was a discussion about a lifeguard. Could you, could someone respond to that? Yeah, I'll be the lifeguard. Sounds like a great job. <laughs> <laughs> um, we um, have not lately been talking about a lifeguard. What we have been talking about is making, you know, Bob Gowans, the chief Gowans, the fire chief, you know, has raised that swift water rescue is a capacity that, you know, our current fire department does not have. So that would need to be something that, you know, we'd look, need to look into as a city. Um, I don't think at this point we're going to be encouraging swimming to the level that we would need a lifeguard. Um, Roy, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but uh, that's not currently part of the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Um, Peter Kelman. Uh, thank you. Um, I have four quick points I'd like to make. The first is that from the very outset, this has been a vision-driven project, not a needs-driven project. And it's been a very particular vision. I too am interested in a facing the river, but I can think of lots of ways to face the river that are nothing like this park. This was, this was a group, there's some of them are here now, some of them have gone on to the Senate, uh, who had this kind of vision for Confluence Park. And that vision didn't include inclusivity. And that's one of the things that bumped up the, um, bumped up with the biggest thing that bumped up the, bu the budget. I think we can address many of the needs and have a beautiful river if we look at it a little differently. Linda mentioned uh, Gateway Park. I was gonna mention that. That fulfills a lot of it. There's also a big stretch of river that we already that we already have going along uh, um, Stonecutter's Way. There are also parking lots that are being used and unused that could have food carts, picnic tables, the works. We, you know, we need to talk to the owners of those parking lots. Some of them we actually lease from the owners. There are many other ways to skin this cat. The last point I would make is this. The finances, there are two ways to look at the finances. One is the way that you guys have framed it. Oh, we're only asking for 600000 We won't ask for any more than that. Well, maybe. And the other way to look at it is, even if we take out the 125000 that's already been spent, that leaves the city with 400 and some thousand to address the real needs of many more people. I really, as one a person who filled out uh, the, you know, participated in some of the focus groups and filled out the forms, all of that was looking at this vision. What did we think about this? It wasn't saying, what would you want? How would you like to face the river? Because when I tried to talk about that to some of them saying, hey, I'd like to see restaurants along the river. I'd like to see the parking lots turned into, you know, places where people really could walk around. And, you know, it, because most of the rivers that I've seen, I've not haven't been to Missoula, but I've been to a ton of cities that have rivers. And most of it is restaurants and, and stores and benches. It's not this kayak uh, vision. 
So I really want you guys to rethink this in terms of what are our needs, not was not what what was a vision of some people who like to kayak. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, is there anyone in the bill? Okay, Steve. Steve Whitaker, uh, I applaud the the vision and the hard work that's gone into it. I question the expense so far, but that's another story. I think that we're really out of touch to uh, be pursuing this at this time when the tax rate is so high and the maintenance neglect is so high. I mean, I've been telling you for four or five years now about the shopping carts in the river. They haven't been removed right within eyesight of this park, right? We don't bother to pull the shopping carts out. We have combined sewage going right in. We don't have signs warning the kids who are swimming right below the sewage. I mean, this is this is pie in the sky stuff. And, and we haven't we haven't addressed the maintenance. We're going to ask people to come down here and have lunch in this, you know, three, two, three, four million dollar park. Meanwhile, we can't get we can't enforce the lease to keep the transit center bathrooms open during lunch hour. I mean, th this park right now is a bathroom for the unhoused. People crap right off the back of the granite blocks under the trees, and y'all have done nothing about any of that. And I reminded you again and again about the lack of maintenance. This park has been an orphan, as has the piece of it on the east side of the bridge, uh, behind the new parking lot behind drawing board, as has the lot right next to drawing board. These are all maintenance neglect. The Parks Commission was war warned and asked again, who's going to mow this? Who's going to pick up the track? It's three years later and the silk blocker isn't out of the storm drain. You know the the shell the it's it's actually a, a, a I don't want to go into too much detail but you've heard it before that you're deluding yourselves and you're ripping off the public to continue to neglect the maintenance and acknowledge the maintenance shortfall you're already doing and start proposing more park. Um, the path along the the, the maintenance of the shrubbery, et cetera, along the bike path, the people, I mean, why our public works department and our parks department and our, you know, tree committee all point the finger at each other. It's not my job to clean up that mess. It's not my job to pick up the crack. Uh, the Shaw's riprap, We're, you're gonna canoe out if the dam were removed. We can't maintain Shaw's riprap. That's Pomerlo's problem. I've been telling you about it. Big construction debris and, and sheets of vinyl and all that stuff just floats down the river and we pretend it's not our problem. You know, we put environmental protection on our goal sheet and then we just trash the river routinely. So you're a bunch of hypocrites. The Haney lot, parking in the Haney lot, we're gonna, we, we forgot. And, and the city risk manager can't account for why the walkway was removed when that curved, curved wall was built that would have provided access. Yet our city plan, downtown plan says maintain walkability between these areas. So you can't walk from Haney Lot in, in, up to the bike path. I've warned, told you about the 90 year old woman trying to drag her grocery cart up there. You're, you're not gonna carry a kayak up there either. So. The dysfunction here is is uh, own it. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else in the build in the room who would like to be heard? Anybody else online? It looks like the only people are people whose hands are just still up. So, uh, council, what's your pleasure? I'd like to make a motion that the council votes to hold the $600,000 that was previously approved by the voters for at least 18 months. And during that time, it will have updates and they can reconsider the, the situation. Um, there. Um, so I feel like it's a little premature since we put, uh, 
item on the city meeting warrant that was asking the voters to give us the flexibility to spend this money or not. Right now, we don't actually have that flexibility. So there's no question. Well, you have this flexibility to spend it or not. You can choose not to spend it. You, the flexibility we to spend for something else. So we could choose the the voters approved a bond, but we don't, that doesn't oblige us to actually take out the bond? Well, no. Okay. It authorizes us to borrow. It money. just authorizes us. So we could say, ah, never mind, we changed our mind. We're not getting it. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you for um, all your hard work. Um, I can see that it will be a really great thing to have in our city. At the same time, all the questions I raised, I couldn't hear very clear answers for them, like the maintenance fee and uh, Councillor Brown mentioned about the bathrooms. And I think it's a good point. Uh, if you wanna do anything like that, you would increase the amount, the cost more. And that's why I think um, we should postpone to say anything uh, tonight. And maybe you can add all this costs in the plan, then we can review it again. Um, idea. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I just want to mention the transit center's bathrooms are there, right within that same parking lot area. So that to me is why bathrooms weren't an issue around the park itself. It's not open. 24-7, but it's open a lot of hours. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I, as somebody who needs to access the river for ceremonial purposes, um, this would be really helpful for community members that do do that. So um, I appreciate the thoughtfulness of having access um, to a water space where you don't need to swim or whatever you can just Access the actual water and touch it and do what you will with it. So I appreciate that. And um, I kind of, I'm, I'm leaning in the direction of Donna's motion. And were you looking to be heard? Sure. Don't yeah, feel I'm pressured, gonna... but we know you, you're not. Yeah, shy. I mean, I, I'm going to, I mean, I second it. I support this motion. Um, I mean, I think. It's clear just the engagement, the depth of work, I mean, the thoughtfulness that has gone into so many of the issues, um, you know, and and at the same time, this is really giving an opportunity to do the fundraising to get us to the full project cost. It's not yet sending out the bond. So I think it's keeping, keeping the project alive, um, knowing that there's still a lot of work to do to get it to you know, the, the vision that is laid out, which I think is really exciting. I think We've talked for the last couple of years um, about, uh, you know, being a recreation hub and being a recreation economy. And like this just really is a central part of that. Just so I think it's economic development. I think it's water access. I think, you know, as an environmental advocate in my day job, just accessing the river and having that be an asset and something that we're protecting and caring for better in our community and removing this hazardous waste that's along our river. I mean, all of it just seems like, like, I think it is stuff that's really important for the community and would really benefit the community. So I'm hopeful. And I, I mean, there's so much federal funding out there and stuff right now. So like fingers crossed that there's ways to access it. The state's talking about recreation funding and there's, so um, I will be thinking of you. And if I see anything, I'll send you <laughs> any, any fun things I come across. Um, so I, you know, I hope we can continue on track and, you know, the concerns I've heard from the community were really if the city was going to commit like $3 million or something, but I think sticking to the 600,000 that we've committed um, so far and looking to, to raise the rest seems, seems like the right call to me at this point. Thanks. Sure. Um, so I, so it's kind of content and process comments. Um, I still don't, I don't feel comfortable saying, uh, yes, we're committing to going ahead or no, we're not committing to go ahead right now. Um, I would like to hear from more 
for more of the public. I'd like to have a little bit more input um, because I do think things, the whole universe that we're living in is so different now than it was when it's not just the time that has passed. Obviously, it's the, the world has changed significantly. And I think it deserves really looking at again. And so I would be a lot happier having a little bit more time. Um, so I'm, I'm uncomfortable with voting yes or no tonight. I'll just say, I'm not sure how I, I would end up voting. But um, the other thing is that somebody made a comment about how this seems like it's really a vision driven process, not so much a needs driven process. And that resonated really strongly with me. So I'm trying to think about what I've been hearing um, tonight and previously about what are the, the needs that we're talking about. And I think, I think there are some that we can kind of identify. There's being, there's cleaning up environmental hazards for sure. There's having some kind of access to the river, which I think is really valuable and some kind of way that we can be actually taking advantage of the fact that there are rivers here instead of it just being like poison ivy and trash. So I think that's important. Um, and I think there are uh, there are a lot of ways to to do that. And then the other the other need that we have is not in your presentation that we have and is not part of this plan, but is you see it every day is for people who are unhoused to have a place to congregate and be and sometimes sleep in Montpelier, and that's what it's being used for right now. And so that's a need that if we're going to spend, not we, but if I, it's, it, it's disturbing me at a core level, the idea of spending $3 million and not meeting the need of the people who are currently using that space. Think of what could be done with $3 million. And I know it is not as straightforward as, not like we have a pile of $3 million and we could decide what to do with it. I know it's a lot more complex than that, but, the, but if we were to put the amount of energy and resources and creativity and visioning and public input and process into helping the people who have nowhere to live in Montpelier and find $3 million to do that, I would feel so much better about our city. And so that's where I'm kind of, kind of wrestling with that right now. <laughs> As the social worker on the council, <laughs> I absolutely hear you. Um, I've been working with homeless people for over 20 years. I was homeless. Um, and I also know that a lot of the homeless people around here are people that have been asked to not return to services because they can't stay sober. And that is something for another conversation on another day. Um, yes, we need something here in town, not in Barry, to help the homeless people in this community, but there is not enough staff. There is yeah. not enough people in this state willing to do the work. And that is why our mental health system is falling apart. Our homeless programs are falling apart. Our domestic violence centers are understaffed because people don't want to do this work anymore. It is it drains your life dealing with people's trauma day in and day out. And my hat goes off to Zach. And I can't remember the other woman's name who does street outreach done. They are the only two in town doing this work. And I don't know how they can keep doing it because it's so hard, but I adore them for doing it. I, I wish that the community would understand that solving a homeless problem isn't a matter of building buildings. It's a matter of people willing to dedicate their time every day to supporting people because they have so much change over service providers are changing constantly. There is no stability for them. And that's why a lot of people are just like, fuck it, I'm done with the system. And I'm just going to live outside because it's easier. I understand all of these things, but building buildings and putting up toilets isn't the only answer. And so I feel like until the state can step it up, quite honestly, and the federal government can address the global, not global, but the country's homeless problem and mental health crisis. I'm sorry, but I'm reacting this way, but it's, it's the hardest work I've ever done in my life and I can't do it anymore, which is why I quit. And 
I don't think anybody at Another Way or any of the other agencies downstreet are willing to say what I'm saying right now, but I'm just going to say it. There's not enough funding for paying people to do the work. People are quitting. People are burning out. People are going out of state. It's, it's horrific right now in this field. So where, what I'm trying to say is that I don't think that just building a structure or a community center or putting up bathrooms is going to solve the problem. It's much deeper than that. Much, much deeper. And while I see we have these other needs, having a place where it's free for people to go and access water and put their kayaks in the river, un like families that can't afford to go to the park or to the pool, I mean, or to the reservoir, that costs a lot of money. I don't have that money. My neighbors don't have that money. So having a free place to go, hell yes. Yes, I would love to have a place to take my kids on a hot summer day that doesn't cost me 10,000 bazillion dollars in gas, food, whatever. I hear you and I'm so glad that you have such a big heart. But I just, I wish that everybody in this town and in the state would understand that solving the homeless problem isn't just a matter of putting up structures. It's much deeper. It's all the systems, all the organizations, everybody's tired and nobody wants to just say that they're tired. Yeah, thanks. I, I hear you. And I think um, this is what is what is causing me such distress right now is that there is energy and money for building a park like this when there isn't for the work that you're talking about. It's the most yeah. frustrating thing yeah. about living in this country for me personally right now is the fact that our mental health system and our social service systems and the police and the fire department and EMTs, people that are uh, boots on the ground, working with the public, working with the homeless people, working with people that are doing sex work, doing drugs, whatever it is, people that are struggling. Those of us that are on the ground doing that work are tired. We have our own trauma now. We're carrying other people's trauma plus our own. And I think, you know, the pandemic has broken people and has broken systems. And nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody just wants to keep avoiding it. Like it's not happening, but try to find a therapist in Vermont. So that's my two cents. Sorry, I didn't mean to get that way, but. I just don't think anybody's talking about what's really happening. Thank you to both of you. I don't I don't think there's any need to be apologetic for getting emotional emotional about people's real suffering. I mean everybody has great ideas of reading the print works form all the time. Like all these beautiful ideas that people have about pallet houses and whatever. Yes, those are great ideas, but who's gonna staff it? Nobody, there's not enough people to do the staffing as it is right now. People in the hotels aren't getting their needs met because there's nobody to do it. Sorry. Um, Donna. I, I agree with, with both of what you're saying, totally. I, I also feel like other avenues have to keep progressing and that at looking at the parks, the art, and looking at recreational revenue. I mean, that's why we talk about removing the dams and white water activities. It, it brings other people in, people who have money, who can spend it, and maybe that's jobs. And so I feel this three, what we have now is a million point one, isn't available for anything else. So it isn't like we're taking money away. Uh, the 600,000 has already been approved by the citizens of Montpelier. So I, I just feel like the flexibility that I voted for to modify the language that this bond is part of is much more about some of the other funds. And I know that we promised something and I'd like us to continue that promise for at least 18 months. And then meanwhile, nothing's gonna happen anyways. It's not gonna be a bond issue. So we have time, but they need to know that we give them that much time. And if it doesn't work out, then we still we don't have the bond. We can make other decisions. So that's what I'm asking. I've I've got a question and maybe Donna or Bill can help help us all think about this. And that is that whether your motion carries or not, 
we can still hold on to this money for the next year, year and a half, right? And uh, obviously, uh, assuming the uh, amendment to the bond uh, passes in uh, next month, what will happen is that there will be other proposals coming to us to spend some of that money, and we'll then have to decide, do we do that, or do we hold on to this $600,000? And uh, that's just a choice we're going to have at that time. I, I just feel that we have partners uh, and that we that made this commitment. And so I feel like they need time. We made this change potentially in the language and that's left them a little bit afloat. And for them to go forward with other solicitation of funds, I feel they need some stability of time that they can count on the 600,000. Mm -hmm. When they're telling grantors, I have this, they should know they have, that's all. And from your perspective is, 18 months the right amount of time is a year the right amount of time what do you think you actually need i think that depends on the specific funding sources if it's federal funding it will take longer because there are more hoops to jump through i think state funding would be a little bit easier than that um i think 18 months will would make sense to come i i, I would hope that we have some progress in 18 months to say here are the opportunities that we pursued. Here's what worked. Here are the, some dead ends we found. Here's what didn't work. Here's what, you know, with another three months will come through. Um, but Donna's absolutely right that, you know, to, to go to funders and say, hey, we have this amount and can you help us get towards our goal? If we don't have that, we, we lost our backbone. You know, we can't, we, we, it's hard to move forward with the fundraising with that. Um, and, you know, will we 100% absolutely get to $3 million? I don't know. I can't promise that. But we can come back to city council and say, this is how far we've come. And do we want to keep moving forward now? Mm -hmm. um, and so it essentially is, is buying us time to continue this good work. And, you know, something that I think is really important, one of the big projects that the city invested in re recently is One Taylor Street which is a transportation hub for people who don't necessarily have a car. And it's a it's mixed income housing. And if you take people and 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 live downtown and live in that space, how amazing is it for those people to also have right next door an outdoor space and space to access to to engage with the river and nature and have that as part of their well-being and kind of the mental health kind of full picture. And it's hard to do, you know, it's, I, I, I would hate to think of this as kind of an either or type of thing. Um, I think this is a whole, like, like let's, this is a part of the whole story for our community. Um, and I think it's a place where we can all lift each other up. Um, and, you know, if we can hold on to these funds, um, let's see, let's see how much we can leverage them. Let's see how we can make Montpelier citizens funds grow. Thank you. Does anyone else on the council have anything more to say before we proceed to a vote? Um, first of all, thank you for the conversation. Um, really grateful. Um, important and challenging <laughs> stuff. Um, I mean, I, I, again, I mean, I think the the pots of money that they're going to be going after are like land and water. It's, a, it's like a different realm of money. I, I still think moving forward with this makes sense with this commitment. I mean, I am thinking about, like we had a conversation a few months ago about there's no shelter, like just a physical space that has a roof where people can get out of the rain. And like, is there some some element in here that, I mean, I know so much thought and design has gone into it, but maybe there's a way to more explicitly look at some of the, because that was like one identified need from the homelessness task force. So that's, yeah, there might, there might be some connections to continue looking at, can we make the space a real asset for the unhousing community in a more explicit way? Okay. I think we are 
ready to vote. Is uh, all those in favor of uh, Dolly's motion indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Motion carries. Thank you all. It has to be four. Oh, it has to be four. It can't be. It has to be four. Yeah. Uh, chair votes for votes aye. Can I just explain my vote yes. really quickly? Um, not voting against Confluence Park. Um, this is a confusing, muddled process. I think that we have right now. If we did nothing tonight, you would be able to carry on the way you're carrying on, um, because the money has been committed, and you know you're you're working ahead. So I'm not, I'm not voting against Confluence Park. I'm I'm. I'm, I'm voting no because, uh, like I said before, I think this needs, if we're going to have this question about are we recommitting to it or are we getting rid of it completely, that it's a, it's a question that deserves more public input and more conversation. That's all. I think it's a beautiful design. <laughs> yeah, just want to echo what you say. Thank you for your all hard work. Yeah, thank and, you. And I think I said no. Oh, I said no because I haven't heard very clear to the point answers to my questions. But I bet our city will enjoy the spark. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. I just yeah. like to make one comment. Um I want I held it till after you voted so that I didn't really think I was trying to influence the vote one way or another. Um just to the extent of some of the, the questions I'd like to point out this park was first envisioned and first discussed by the public in 2002. It was part of the bond vote for the, the one Taylor Street, the car lot at the time. And it's actually in the language of the bond vote at that time and uh, had been an active part of the planning for that project. And as, as was a parking garage. Uh, and as time went by and the environmental reviews went and, you know, Money changed, things had to drop out of the project. And the first thing that dropped was the parking structure because it's expensive. The second thing that dropped was this. Um, but the reason that lot was designed the way it is with that space at the end was because this has been a vision for over 20 years. So I just want to be clear there was, you know, I, I, this is not a new vision. It's not a vision of recent council members, recent city officials. It's been a community vision for a long period of time. And it was only, uh, it was essentially, we couldn't focus on this portion of the project until the rest of it was completed. And when it was done, the then city council said, okay, now it's time to continue the rest of the project that we had envisioned 20 years ago. So, um, you know, I think sometimes it's good to have the history of these things. This isn't, a, you know, whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, it isn't a new one. It's not a recent somebody's, you know, kayak happy idea. It was an idea that the community articulated a very extensive community process published happening at the time in the turn of the century. Yeah, and I and I thank you for pointing that out. I want to acknowledge that I'm I'm new on the city council. I wasn't part of a strategic planning process that included this. Um I, I do remember the votes in the past and and just as a voter, I do remember facing the question on the ballot to approve funding for X and Y and Z and P and Q and Confluence Park. And there was no way for me to say, well, I really want a parking garage, but I'm I'm not sure how I feel about a park. And so and I'm not trying to say it's good or bad. I was just saying that so going forward, I think it's a lesson that I'm going to keep in mind that when we're asking the voters for things that we're that we're not smashing a whole bunch of different things together and then assuming that there's equal support for all of them when it passes. Okay, thank you. Um, now you have the commitment for at least this period of time, and I hope you're successful <coughs> in using the money. Next up, we ha don't have anything under other business, so council reports. We start with uh, Councilor Bates. I do want to mention the Pardon Commission. I'm just thrilled to be back on it, um, and. They really uh, led the way with diversity, equity, and inclusion as they are approaching dog policy changes in the park and lots of public input. And whatever they end up deciding, they really have worked hard 
to balance balance the need in the park for people to walk their dogs on a leash and off a leash. Um, so it, I really salute them for that. Thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with that. It's a tremendous amount of work that I think has been very well done. Um, the restroom committee met, I believe, for the first time recently, and and I went just as an interested person. Uh, and I don't know that we have anybody from city council on that committee at this time. And I would love to be a city council representative on that committee if we need it. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Asking you shall receive. Okay. And by by acclamation, you're All right. Appointed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it is very cold outside, and thank you for cleaning all the roads so I can take my kids uh, to school, which my son doesn't want to go anyway. So he is really asking for a snow day every single day. Uh, <laughs> But I just want to mention one thing. Um, there's a bridge when you go to River Street. And um, when you, it is very narrow bridge. And now there are ice in both sides. And it makes it really, really narrower. And it is really difficult to, you know, drive there. I'm real, I am afraid of hitting another car. So is there any plan? at least on the bridges, just clean the ice because they make everything so small to pass through. So I just want to mention this. Thank you. Presumably you're talking about Granite, the Granite Street Bridge. So, the so there's a co the co-op, then, yeah. then you take and you go River Street. Yeah. 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 Thank and, you. and there's a historic reason for why it has to be that narrow. <laughs> Well, I was just wanting you to encourage people, call DPW. They do like to know when drivers are having problems. I, I called about potholes the other day, just as a citizen. Just call and say, I experienced two potholes, blah, blah, blah. I gave them the location. <laughs> okay, so yeah, just call great, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, great advice. Us. Okay, so <laughs> I will mention, but why not? Just, just, you know, we are, you yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mentioned a pothole to the city manager just yesterday, and it turns out it's not a pothole, it's one of those uh, uh, receivers. Um, my report is, you know, today, um, I, I just can't understand why we have so many millions of guns in this country, but today we had another one of these uh, hoaxes in Montpelier and uh, in many schools around around Vermont, and I don't know if it's all around the country too, but uh, high praise to the to our police department, or too bad the chief left, but high praise to the police department for the way they handled it and the way they got the information out as uh, as quickly as they could because people are sending their kids to school. They want them to be safe and hear about this and it's gotta be freaking them out. Um, and that's all I've got, Jennifer. Sorry, um, I'd like to echo um, what you just said um, and thank Liddy Bonesteel for, um, it was a myriad of messages I received today, but I would much rather receive a ton of messages yeah. than one. Um, and they were coming back to back and via email and text. And I just, I really appreciate the way the schools and um, police departments handled that situation today. As a parent of two students, uh, it was really sketchy and nerve wracking and all the bad things are going through my LA brain. Um, but, I, I don't have anything else. And I, I really do want to apologize for my little outburst tonight. That is not how I like to carry myself, but I, I do feel very passionate about the homeless people in this country. So that's why I get that way. That's all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Appreciate you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I also just wanted to um, thank the 
police departments, I mean, the, the, the response, the communication with the community being quick, and it seemed like it was really handled with care and sounded like they had, you know, staff, um, you know, um, the Washington County Mental Health and like to help the students. And, you know, I was getting the calls as a parent with kids in two of the schools. My husband is a teacher at another of the schools that was also going through the lockdown. So too many guns and people supporting <laughs> the mental health services yeah. and other things in the country. But um, yeah, so that was stressful. Um, one other thing just wanted to um, appreciate when the cold snap was coming through, I thought the city did a really good job of communicating the options for where people could go uh, to stay warm and, um, you know, the power now. So the, the proactive communication around that, that was great to see that there were a lot of options and that that was pushed out through a bunch of that. All right. This is the city clerk have a report. Oh, just the balance are taking a lot longer to come in. They're not even here yet. No, right? they're not. Um, been bouncing back and forth on that. I think I've been told the drop dead date is going to be uh, next Wednesday. I think you're going to Oh, I think the drop dead date is going to be next Wednesday if nothing else comes up with them. But I still have some hope we'll get somebody into the week. And uh, how are we doing on? So far. Oh, it's pathetic. <laughs> we hardly have any. I can't believe it. I'm trying to remember my old calculus I used to use to figure out, to project the, the final turnout based on the early vote requests. I don't remember what it was, but if that still holds true, this is going to be a tiny turnout. Um, so uh, we'll see. I mean, that could pick up and change very quickly, but I'm astonished by how few requests there are. Maybe once the word gets out, ballots are here. You know, the people get. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. People are all confused all over the map on that. So. <laughs> well, we got to get the word out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we should probably do one to begin. I know we've done it already. Yep. I, I put that out regularly on Front Porch Forum. I'm due for another one. Um, so, yeah. And anything else is that it? Oh, that's it. And city manager's report. Yeah, so I'll, I'll join the chorus of people thanking our public safety responders today. Um, obviously, delighted that it was a hoax because nobody got hurt. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate their uh, care and response. I got called uh, by the two chiefs. They were riding together to the scene. And at that point, they already suspected it was a hoax. Uh, in part because of the out-of-state number and because there had been no calls from the high school. And, you know, it just stands to reason that you know, we don't want to think about these things. There was a gunshot and gun off. Everybody with a cell phone would have been calling 911. And so yet, um, my point, though, was even then, they treated, everybody treated it as though it was a real one. It wasn't like, you know, we don't think there's much to this. So it was like, we have to prepare for the worst. These are our kids. This is a community. And I really appreciate the turnout. We had multiple agencies arrive. A huge amount of resources were mobilized on behalf of this, you know, person who made this call. And I have no idea how the other communities responded, but a lot of a lot of wasted emergency. But I guess maybe some training on the bright side. Um, the only other thing I mentioned because it came up earlier tonight, someone asked about uh, the city manager's review and how. First, point out that if anybody ever has any questions about anything that we do, you're welcome to ask. We're welcome to bring them up at a council meeting to try to you know, raise a point. Uh, but we do have a, a mechanism that is distributed to city council. They fill out. It was initially based on a recommended form by the ICNA, the International City Managers Association. It has been modified to be modularized over the years. Um, and we also look at uh, the strategic plan. Uh, and how uh, accomplishments are there. And uh, we usually, uh, the council does a written version of it. I see it. I also provide my own self evaluation in response to those forms, which goes into the mix. And then we meet and talk about uh, what went well, what didn't go well, and where we could improve, uh, whether it's me personally or the team, all of us as a, as a group for the next year for the benefit of the community. So that is the process. And certainly people 
at any point, at any time over a 12 month year, can inform the city council how to deal with any aspect of city government is working, including you know, should have to wait until just now. If someone wants to offer their opinions, they're should be welcome to communicate with their elected officials at any time or to I'm always happy to hear people's uh, comments. And criticisms. Thanks. Okay. And oh, and one other question. Oh. Uh, no, just on that same point, I forgot something else. There is also an aspect of a 360. Uh, I have a professional credential through ICMA. And uh, every it's either three or five years, I can't remember off the top of my head, I'm required to do a 360 review to include staff, members of the public, et cetera. And even though it's for my own professional credential, I've always shared that with the council. So we don't do it every year, but when it happens, I'm shared and it's part of the conversation. Thanks. All right. Well, I was uh, predicting tonight that it would be an early night. It's not. It's it's still it's still <laughs> early. You know, it's, it's, it's not as early as I thought it might be. But uh, at nine forty, we will be in adjourned.